what I that's what I figured. We will, no problem. We got it. The answer is yes. Okay. Okay. What we wanted that for? For we all wanted that. You want to put it on here? What do you want? Yeah, let's push that up so we get This meeting of the Escambia County Board of Adjustment for March 9, 2023 is hereby called to order with five members present. We have a quorum. Will the clerk please swear in members of the staff?
I do. Members of the board, copies of staff's resumes have previously been prevented, presented to you and remain on file for reference. The board has previously recognized staff as expert witnesses. Does anyone have any questions regarding their qualifications and abilities to offer expert testimony? Seeing none. The BOA meeting package for March 9, 2023 with the Development Service Staff's findings of fact has previously been provided to board members. The chair will now entertain a motion to accept the BOA meeting package into evidence. Do we have a motion? So moved. We have a motion, we have a second. Those in favor signify by raising your right hand. Passes unanimously. Do we have proof of publication? Excuse me, Mr. Abby, did, did you hear who said the motion? Yes, it's Jennifer Bass. Okay, thank you. Yes, go ahead. Yes, we have proof of publication. The chair will now entertain a motion to waive the reading of the legal advertisement. Do we have a motion? So moved. We have a second. Second. Those in favor signify to raise your right hand. Passes unanimously. Sir. The Board of Adjustment hears administrative appeals, variances, and conditional use requests. These hearings are quasi-judicial in nature. Quasi-judicial hearings are like evidentiary hearings in a court of law, however less formal. All public testimony will be taken under oath, and anyone testifying before the BOA may be subject to cross-examination. All documents and exhibits that the BOA considers are entered into evidence and are made a part of the record. The giving of opinion testimony will be limited to experts and closing arguments will be limited to the evidence in the record. After hearing the testimony and the arguments for and against the proposed action and before making its decision, the BOA will consider the relevant testimony, the exhibits entered into evidence and the applicable law. Because decisions of the BOA relating to variances, conditional uses, and extensions of development orders for site plan approval are final, unless overturned by a court of competent jurisdiction, the county may issue development orders and permits for properties in accordance with the decisions of the BOA. However, if an applicant requests the issuance of such an order or permit, and such an order or permit is issued, the applicant and not the county shall bear any risk that such decisions may be set aside, the development order or the permit may be revoked, or the development may be otherwise enjoined by the reviewing court. Any applicant for relief from a decision of the BOA for said actions or any aggrieved party as defined by state law may seek review of such decisions by filing an appropriate pleading in a court of competent jurisdiction within 30 days of the BOA decision. The date of the BOA decision shall be the date the BOA voted at the conclusion of the hearing. Whenever the BOA denies an application, no new application for an identical action on the same parcel shall be accepted for considerations within a period of 180 days of the BOA decision. Any person aggrieved by a decision of the BOA relating to an appeal of an administrative decision may within 15 days thereafter apply to the circuit court for review. Each individual 
who wishes to address the board regarding a particular issue must complete the blue request to speak form and submit it to the clerk of the board. These forms are located on the table at the back of the commission chambers. You will not be allowed to speak until we receive one of these completed requests to speak forms. We must complete the, we must have these completed forms for the public record. All written or oral communication outside of this hearing with members of the BOA regarding matters under review today are considered ex parte communications. Ex parte communications are presumed prejudicial under Florida law and must be disclosed as provided in the Board of County Commission Resolution 96-13 before a decision by this board on any administrative appeal, variance, or conditional use the request. The chair would ask, as each case is heard, that any board member who has been involved in any ex parte communication regarding the respective issue to please identify themselves and to disclose the communication. I believe to get us all on the same page, if the staff would at this time present maps and photos of uh, the considered property. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good morning. Andrew Homer, Escambia County Development Services Department. Okay. The reason we're here, this is appeal case AP 2023-02. Just to get us in the area, this is our location map. As you can see, the area bordered in red is the parcels in question. South of Nine Mile, north of Johnson, east of Jernigan, and west of University. This is a 500 foot radius map showing the zoning for these parcels is high density mixed use and the rather wet parcel to the north. Um, is medium density residential. <clears throat> Excuse me. What we also have here is our future land use map from our comprehensive plan, our overarching document, showing the future land use for the site is mixed use urban. This is an aerial map of the site. Um, you can see with the blue and green hatching, those are areas identified in the 2006 National Wetlands Inventory map. You can also see the thin blue lines on the map are two tributaries bounding this property development. Uh, those both go north and feed into Thompson Bayou. This is a public hearing sign posted on Finley Drive where these parcels connect with that right of way. I'm sorry, computer is thinking. Yeah, probably shouldn't have done that, okay. This is looking west on Finley Drive, um, across that, the, the woods there um, on the north side are the parcels in question that where they adjoin that right of way. This is looking east on Finley from the same location. This is a public hearing sign that was posted uh, on Jojo Road at the intersection where it becomes west side. This is on the overall map. This is in this area where there is a connection between those two roads at that curve. Okay, this is from that, that curve. This is looking west on JoJo. So 
Sorry about that technical difficulty. I'm going to have to go slower. Okay, let me have to hook up the other computer, get my computer up. Let's do this. Did it go around me? I know. Um, Lord, if I could have, uh, hang on, I think we're going to change computers. Let me see if I can get through this without doing so. This is looking east on JoJo towards the entrance. Uh, down in the end there is the curve. This is up close. Uh, it's the location of the entrance for this proposed development. This is at that west side and JoJo curve. And this is looking north from that location along west side drive. Yeah. Okay. If it'll let me, I'm going to come down here. <clears throat> and this is the, the uh, preliminary plat in question. Sorry, I'm using the wrong mouse. Okay, so just to set the stage for you, um, that what is on the screen is a preliminary plat that was submitted through the county's development review committee. On January 11th, 2023, a development order for this project known as Outpost Bayou, which is a proposed 22.95 acre, 157 single lot family, uh, single family townhouse subdivision was denied by the development review committee. The denial was based on compatibility and detailed and an attachment to the development order. On January 25th, 2023, the applicant filed the administrative appeal application meeting the land development code 15 day submittal requirement. This special BOA meeting was scheduled for today in accordance with the LDC provision that the quasi judicial public hearing for the appeal shall be scheduled to occur within 30 business days after the receipt of a complete application. Thank you. That's your maps and photographs. Okay, Drew, I wonder if it'd be possible to show the uh, page. Uh, there's not a number on it, but it is uh, <coughs> starts with standing three, standing four, compliance review is what I'm looking for, A through E. Let me, hang on just one second. I didn't mean to. Oh. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, what you're showing is a, um, a portion of our land development code. There we go, sir. Um, <clears throat> what this is, this is a section from our land development code is section 2-6.10. This is the section dealing with the appeal of administrative decisions. And the portion you're referring to is these pieces. Right Can you move it up to compliance review four or a, there we go. Yeah, 
because I can't read that. Board members, <coughs> I just wanted to refresh you on what we're looking at because the parameters are a bit different than reviewing a variance or a conditional use. And, okay. and uh, this is basically uh, what, what, we're, uh, what we're dealing <coughs> with. At this time, uh, we will call the uh, applicant to uh, make a presentation. I believe uh, if you're an attorney, it's not necessary to be sworn, but do state your name and uh, spell your last name also for the court reporter. Mr. Chairman, could I ask, before we get into the uh, testimony, Drew, you're in the code. There's a definition for uh, compatibility. Can, can you find that real quick? Oh, sorry, I did it on the wrong screen. Is it, is it D? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I think that we should, as we get into this, uh, I think it's helpful that we review this just to keep in mind what what we're looking at. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, thank you, sir. Horace Jones, well, I'm Mr. Holmes finding that. Horace Jones, Director for the Development Service Department. As defined in the Land Development Code, currently in effect, it says, Chapter 6, Compatibility from the Land Development Code, a condition in which land uses, activities, or conditions can, co can, can coexist in a relative proximity to each other in a stable fashion over time, such as, such as that known use, activity, or condition is unduly negatively impacted directly or indirectly by another use, activity, or conditions. Also, it is also supported by in which the comprehensive plan states the definition for incompatibility and compatibility as well. Comprehensive plan states incompatibility slash compatibility definition. Incompatibility is, is new development proposed to be constructed next to an existing development way in the proximity of two kinds of development which would each diminish the usefulness of the other or would be detrimental to existing operations. The incompatibility can arise from either land uses or structure size and design. Compatibility development is new development from the comprehensive plan in support of the LDC is new development proposed to be constructed next to existing development in which the proximity of two kinds of development would, would each complement or enhance the usefulness of the other. Those are the definitions that we will be that would be coming up throughout this presentation. Mr. Chairman, I just thought we ought to have that in our minds as we listen to this testimony. Also, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think we have a number of attorneys. Did you want everybody to make their appearance? Uh, I understand there's an, some interveners that we probably ought to look at before we get too far into it. I think let's uh, m let the applicant make a presentation and then we'll get into the, those others. I think uh, everybody will probably want to speak. We are going to be begin the hearing now for Appeal 2023-04. Board members, has there been any ex parte communication regarding this case? Seeing none, does anyone have knowledge or information obtained from a site visit or other sources? 
Seeing none. Does any board member intend to refrain from voting <coughs> due to a voting conflict of interest? Seeing none. Would the uh, main applicant who is representing this appeal please come to the podium and identify yourselves at this time? Chairman, my name is Philip Pugh. I'm an attorney. I represent Matrix Property Services, LLC, the applicant. Thank you, sir. Uh, if I may proceed, sir, um, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I appreciate your time here today yes, uh, and listening to us. As you know, my client, uh, Matrix, is the property owner who has submitted this request for a development. Uh, the development in question is uh, essentially townhomes. What we're looking at is attached single-family residential homes. And um, this being a, uh, Mr. Mr. Pierre, if you can, some people in the back so they can't hear you, so you may have to speak up a little speak louder. A little bit. Yes, sir. All right, is that microphone working? Can y'all hear me all right? Yeah, all right, yeah. very good. Uh, appreciate you, uh, uh, Mr. Jones. So, uh, as I was saying, the development in question is a townhome development. Uh, this is a 22 acre parcel under HDMU. It's zoned for as much as 25 units per acre. My client is trying to put in eight units per acre. Um, the, as you know, uh, it was denied, um, and what I'd like to do, if I could first, uh, let me just go to the map. Uh, Mr. Homer, if you could pull up, I believe page five is probably the most relevant uh, page. Mr. Homer, let me, tell you what, let me get you to go ahead and go up two pages to page three, please, sir. There we go. All right, so this, as you saw initially, this gives you the initial layout or the overall layout of the area. If you look over to your left to the west, you're looking at Jernigan Road. So as you know, you'll come off of Nine Mile Road, turn south on Jernigan, left on <coughs> Finley is to the south, and that's the one that makes the loop there to the bottom. JoJo is going to be to the north. Um, my client's parcels are what you see there in red. There's five parcels, two internal, two on Finley, one across JoJo, altogether 22 acres. The plat that you initially saw there uh, as the preliminary plat is actually about the third or fourth version of that plat. Mr. H uh, Hammond, who prepared all that, is going to go through this with you as a witness here in a moment. Uh, but what you'll find is that, as I said, this place was zoned for 25 units per acre. Through the course of this process, that number has been reduced and reduced and reduced. Uh, this is actually going to be a first for me to, to be before you in a scenario where sign-off was obtained from every single department. A multiple conditions were placed on the development, and my clients were amenable to every condition that was requested and agreed to comply with every single condition. Then the subdivision was denied. Uh, the development order was denied. So that's a first for me. I've never seen... And I believe Mr. Hammond will testify in 25 years of this practice, he has never had every member of the DRC sign off on a development order, all the conditions be met, and then to have the development order refused because it's quote unquote incompatible. Now, when you look on either side of, uh, all the way around this unit, I want to show you what the adjacent property uh, uses are. Go down, please, Mr. Homer, to the map. Thank you, sir. You see, to your south, and I believe this is where you, you get a lot of the objection from the community, is to the south you have single family residential there around Finley Drive. Now, initially when this subdivision was to be put in, the original plan was to have two roads, come, two entrances coming into Finley Drive. My client has something like 400 feet on the public right of way on Finley Drive. I believe they have every right to come in off of Finley Drive. but. There was objection, and so they redrew their plans. So no, we, we won't do that. We won't come through Finley Drive. In fact, they've agreed now to come in off JoJo Road on the north side. They've agreed to, they were asked to build a bridge across those wetlands that you see right there and extend JoJo Drive all the way out to the north side of their property. 
and then give all that infrastructure to the county so that they could come in from the north side and therefore not increase traffic on Finley Road. They agreed to do that. I actually personally attended the meeting during the, the process where we made that proposal and agreed that the only thing we would use Finley Drive for was to come in during construction and then we would shut it down. That was refused. The county asked us, no, please don't even use it for construction because you may damage the road. We agreed to do that. So the current plan on the table is for the developer to build a bridge. This is going to take them. This is going to cost them a million dollars and take them a year. They'll build a bridge across Jojo, give all that to the county, never access the property over Finley Drive. Come in from the north side. You'll have one access point on Finley that is emergency use only. It's, it, it'll never be used. And after that agreement was made, then the development order was refused because of again incompatibility now I want you to look on the east side of the property those are apartment buildings that are backed up to my clients property line on the west side of the property when you come in on Jojo Road you're going to drive past the Bennett apartments then past Miss Bennett's home and then into this property right here so the parcel that is supposedly incompatible with attached single family use is has apartments on both sides of it. The single family uh, use that 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 we've that we're we're hearing complaints from is to the south, where there is no access point and there will be buffering along that entire parcel. Now, I would ask Mr. Homer if you could go to the development order the the. Uh, where it was denied. <coughs> this is the development order uh, that, that, that was denied that's given rise to this appeal. What you heard was that the denial was detailed uh, in an attachment. Let me ask you, Mr. Uh, Homer, if you would go down to the end of this document. Notice all the conditions. This document was, all of these conditions, these special project conditions were worked out between the developer and uh, county staff over the course of the last year, every single one of which was agreed to by my client. And come on down, you get a denial here. The denial says it's for the reasons noted below. Now come on down to Exhibit A. This is your detail. I'm going to ask you to take a look at that and note there is not one provision of the LDC that is that is um, identified here as a justification for this denial. The only thing it says is it's found to be not compatible with adjoining uses. Now, let me ask you a question. NHDMU, it, it's a mixed use urban scenario, right? Commercial property is allowed. We're not doing commercial property, okay? Clearly, there's got to be some discretion on the part of the staff to be able to say, well, if you're jumping from one end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum in the same unit adjacent to each other, sure, there, there can be incompatibility concerns. But the suggestion here is that going from single family residential, from attached, I'm sorry, detached single family residential to attached single family residential is an incompatibility. You cannot do that. That is fundamentally nonsensical. If that can be done, then if you build a single family home in HDMU, the rest of the unit can, can, cannot be used for anything else. You can never step up to the next level. If we were asking to go to commercial next door, sure. You, you, you've jumped a couple of units. There's some incompatibility. There's allowed by the zoning code. It's allowed by the comp plan. Maybe there's some incompatibility issues. But how do you argue that going from residential to residential with proper buffering is incompatible? It, at some point, you, you get, if they've met every provision of the LDC, if they've agreed to meet every condition that's been required, if they've agreed to put in whatever buffering was, was asked for, 
they agreed to flip their subdivision over so that they would not access the road with houses on it, but rather access the road with apartments on it. They've agreed to, to build new access to come in from the other side. If you've met every single provision of the LDC, and after doing all of that, a staff member can wave their hand over and say, well, it's incompatible. Without any reference to a code provision, we've left the rule of law. At that point, the LDC doesn't matter anymore. It, it, it can't work that way. There's got to be some tangible sense of what is allowed in this it, to be done here. And again, my client is asking to go from residential to residential. The code provides, there's an entire code provision on buffering. When you have potentially incompatible things, if you're going from residential to commercial, you buffer it. That's not what we're doing. We're going from residential to residential, and yet we are buffering it. My client will show you, Mr. Hammond is going to show you on his preliminary plat all the things that he did to minimize the impact. And so I would ask this board to hold the staff to some standard more than to simply say, well, it's incompatible. There's, there's, there's got to be some basis, some standard for that. And with that, I would, ask, uh, I would like to call Mr. Hammond, who is the engineer of record. Mr. Hammond? Are you an attorney, sir? No, I'm the engineer of record. Oh, okay. M if you'll be sworn. Mr. Chairman, I, and I do want to point out that Mr. Hammond has been accepted by this board as an expert witness in the past. Yes. Sorry. Yes, ma'am, I do. Mr. Chairman, I would move that we accept Mr. Hammond as an expert. We have a motion. We have a second. I think he's already accepted, but yeah. let's do it. Let's do it again. Second. We have a second. Those in favor, signify by raising your right hand. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hammond, if you could um, tell us, uh, you, you're a professional engineer, sir. Yes, sir. All right, and you specialize in residential subdivision development, is that right? That's one of the things I specialize in, yes, sir. How long have you been uh, doing residential subdivision development in Camden County? Well, I was found, founded Hammond Engineering in 2001, so that's 22 years. Yes, sir. Right. And uh, can you describe to the board for me the process by which you uh, brought this uh, development before the various departments? Sure. Um, we made a pre-application submittal to the DRC in October 20, 2021. And I have the comments here, and there's no, t there's nothing about it being incompatible. There's a bunch of comments, but nothing about it being incompatible. That was 218 units. So <clears throat> we made a preliminary plat submittal on May 12, 2022. It was down to 182 units. And the reason being is in this county, when you do a preliminary plat, when you do construction plans, they got to match. So even though I wasn't doing the construction plans, I had to, I had to go ahead and just design this project. So I did a full de a full, full stormwater design, basically. And when I put the ponds in, designed it at the state and county standards, it took it down to 185 units. That's what we initially submitted to DRC, the full application. And I got the comments here, nothing in it about incompatibility. Um, and here's where I got planning to sign off on a disposition sheet through the first submittal. Griff, Griff Vickery was the reviewer. Um, I got everybody's signature on disposition sheet that time except for the surveying department. The surveying department found a bust in the survey that, we, that was part of our project, the boundary survey. So we withdrew the application, got a new boundary, come up with a new preliminary plat, redesigned the stormwater, made a second submittal, on August 25th, 2022, and was down to 162 units. Got the comments, worked through the comments, turned it back in for final comparison. Grid victory planning, signed off 921-22. Made a final comparison submittal. Um, lots of objections. So special conditions started coming out. 
build the bridge, pay for it, then you can access the site for construction. Um, can access Finley, improvements, make improvements to JoJo Road because it's substandard road, buffering, just a number of things. Yes, sir. Right, what did they ask? What did the staff ask the developer to do with JoJo Road? Initially, this is, this, this is going to final comparison on the second submittal. Initially, they said upgrade um, JoJo Road because it's substandard road, which there's not enough right away there. It's not, I mean, that's why it's not upgraded now, probably. And there's big oak trees down the side of it and that type of thing. Um, I pushed back a little bit and then. Um, they backed up a little bit and said, all right, well, if you can put that force main in for a sewer down JoJo Road and not tear it up, then you ain't got to improve it. So we're probably going to tear up the road some, putting the force main in. So there will be improvements made by my client <clears throat> on JoJo Road if this project was to go forward. But basically because we're going to tear it up, putting the force main in. So the client has agreed to fix and upgrade JoJo Road? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If we pull up your preliminary plans, can you describe to the board members what you were asked to do and what you have done to address buffering? We left 15 foot up against any other parcel at single family residential. Let's get your plan up there so we can see what you're looking at. Mr. Holmes, would you zoom in a little bit on the southern end? You can see the hatch right there, Drew, you got your, you know where I'm talking about. That's all buffering. It's not even part of the lots. It's just going to be totally undisturbed. Whatever woods are there is going to stay there. And we did the same thing down the west property line, bordering any piece of property that was single family residential. Now what's going to be in these, uh, the traffic that you look at when you're in the southern parcel? That's going to be the amenity site. So there would be a pool in the parking lot and the pool house and the mail kiosk. And just describe this access point to us. That's a full access drawn in there, but it's going to be closed with a gate so that only um, black safety vehicles can get in. All right, other conditions in the uh, Mainly the bridge that we couldn't access the site at all from Finley, though we had 400 foot of frontage, not for construction or for any purpose at all. And we agreed to it, so we'd be we delayed a project a year building bridge, then come in and clear the site and do our work. Once you got this preliminary plan submitted, you were uh, again you had to route it through every department. You got every department signature. This yeah, that time I got everybody to sign it. And then it was denied at the New York City. I, yes, sir. In in your 22 years in Tampa County, do you think you ever obtained every department signature and then had the DRC decline the building? No, sir. Have you been able to successfully have townhome development approved in the same type of zoning district that was in the same district in the past? Yes, sir. Have, have you ever experienced anything quite like that? No, sir. Um, if I can I riff on something for a second? All right. So I, I'm sorry. I hate to disturb you for a second. Mr. Pugh, I'm not sure your microphone's picking up. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Homer. Go ahead, Mr. Hammond. Um, on May 4th of last year, I received a development order for a preliminary plaque structure plans for Bella Rosa. It's townhomes, got single family residential around it on roads that are substandard roads. The only difference in that project and this project is that project was HDR zone, this one's HDMU, and that project's in District 3 and this one's in District 1.
Any other questions? You ready for questions? In your opinion, as an expert, having done this in this county for 22 years, do you believe that a going from detached single family to attached single family with proper buffering is incompatible? No, sir. I don't know what you'd put up next to it. If the single family detached isn't compatible with single family attached, then like he said earlier, what use would there be allowed compatible? Those are my questions for the witness. Board members, any questions on the applicant for the applicant? I got a couple questions for the engineer. Um, President Smith, I rise for a point of um, clarity we as the intervener have filed a motion to intervene and I understand the uh, president has asked that we consider that after the applicant but I do want to point out that we do have a right to cross-examine the witness and I would ask that we be allowed to potentially take that motion up now so that we have that opportunity for cross-examination and then we could proceed with with, with the questioning Board members? Mr. Chairman, I, I think it is, would be the best course, it strikes me at least, to go ahead and we do have the petition for the interveners uh, to consider it now uh, in order that uh, we decide the question of whether or not it be granted. And if it is granted, then at that point in time, the intervener's attorneys would have the right to uh, cross-examine. It would seem to be the point in time we would look at that, so, to me. You want to, can you make that a motion? Mr. Chairman, I understand uh, there is a petition to, for, to intervene. Could we? That is correct. Uh, could we take a look at the petition before we Go forward. Yes, sir. This is already ad admitted in the uh, record. It isn't? No, sir. Mr. Chairman, I think we, if we could hear from Mr. Dunaway on it, it might help us understand and then a petitioner's attorney will have of course the right to make argument if he wishes I think we need to make a motion to admit this into evidence yes, yes. mr. That. chairman I'll I'll move the petition we have a motion do we have a second second we have a second those in favor signify by raising your right hand passes unanimously. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think uh, the petitions attorney would have the right to make argument if he wishes. It's my understanding that the intervener is an adjacent property owner, is that correct? I have no objection to the motion to intervene. All right. Mr. Chairman, I think we're ready to hear cross-examination. Okay. 
thought. Donna what? I actually I would kinda like to know when this petition came about and why we weren't notified prior to the meeting. The petition was submitted to staff this week. It was made part of the case file. Mr. Pugh was copied on it. Um, it was after the um, the meeting package was already public published, uh, at which point then it became something for this board to decide to accept. And legally, from our attorney, we have the purview to either accept or reject this, correct? You do. However, it does appear, based on what's represented in this motion, that this third party does have standing, legal standing, to intervene. So I would caution, unless there is some question, I would caution against prohibiting the intervention if there is, in fact, evidence that this third party has legal standing. All right, I just wanted to clarify. Mr. Chairman, did you wish to hear uh, cross-examination by Mr. Dunaway? Although Ms. Bass had some questions, I think. Uh, We'd certainly like uh, the board to ask whatever questions they have, um, Mr. Chairman whatever you desire. I, I believe we're at the point of allowing you to uh, speak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and for the record, my name is uh, Will Dunaway. I represent uh, the law firm of Clark Partington. And in this case, uh, the intervener, um, Mr. And Mrs., uh, Mr. and Mrs. Brown, who are adjacent property owners, as your board attorney has indicated. Um, we. Our motion that has been accepted for intervention unopposed uh, shows that she is the adjacent property owner, or one of the adjacent property owners to this project. I'm here at the table with my partner, uh, Meredith Bush. Um, we will present evidence at the appropriate time. At this time for just a couple of questions of cross-examination of uh, Mr. Hammond. Mr. Hammond, in, in reviewing and direct testimony, you talked about the various iterations of your uh, site plan starting in October of 21. Um, who was the client at that time in October of 21? I think I was, work, I was working for Graham Girl at the time. And was that an entity called Three Brothers? It might be. I'm not sure what they are. And did the property transfer uh, subsequent to that time? It might have transferred, but I think it's still the same owner. Do you know um, how the property was put together, the different parcels that were put together, including the two parcels that are lots on Finley Avenue? I have no idea how that, all that happened. That came about before your involvement? Yes, sir. Um, with regards to the JoJo Road, is that a 30-foot wide um, right-of-way? It's, it's possible. I don't, that's what it says, yes, sir. Surveyor says it's 30 foot. And do you know that the pavement width is 18 feet? I personally measure it. It's 19 in some places. It's 18 in others. Understood. You testified that um, through the iteration from October of 2021 uh, with the initial uh, site plan that you did for Three Brothers, um, you had subsequent uh, submittals. You had one on April the, uh, in 22, is that correct? Yes, sir. Then you had another in August of 22, is yes, that sir. correct? And then you had another in September of 22? September was the final comparison of the second full submittal. And, and throughout those uh, that time, you were getting uh, comments and um, critique from staff, is that correct? Yes, sir. And those comments were things that you were uh, required to address and change with regards to the land development code? Yes, sir. And those uh, comments, uh, you had uh, you had feedback on those and those resulted in the plan changing uh, those many times, correct? Yes, sir. 
did you understand that you were simply trying to come into compliance with the comp plan and the land development code through these comments or did you consider them to be unnecessary meddling in the process no i don't think they're unnecessary it's the normal process that you go through okay so it is the normal process to submit a site plan get comments from staff try to address those and then move forward yes sir and then it's the ultimate determination of whether a plan is approved or not approved is at the DRC, correct? Yes, sir. And at the DRC, that plan was denied, correct? Yes, sir. And you're familiar with the uh, comprehensive plan uh, and the concept of compatibility, correct? Yes, sir. And you understand that the staff made a determination that this project was not compatible, correct? Yes, sir, eventually they did. Mr. Holmer, if you would scroll just a little bit higher and come in on the amenities parcel. At the <clears throat> if, there, that's good right there. Uh, go back out just a little bit and go back and scroll to your right. Okay, move it over. Yep. So, Mr. Hammond, in that area that is proposed as the amenities area, uh, and Mr. Homer, would you put your cursor in that uh, block there? That's, is that the amenities area? Yes, sir. And is that the area that is planned for a swimming pool, a pool house, a parking area, and a mail kiosk? Yes, sir. And is that Findlay Drive that is the southern boundary of that amenity area? Yes, sir. And is Findlay Drive the drive that supports the um, cul-de-sac, which is the Finley Drive neighborhood? Was well, a loop. A loop? You, yes, sir. Mm, a closed loop? Yes, sir. How do you access that closed loop? From Jernigan Road. From Jernigan Road. And whose property is that to the west of your property bounding Finley Road? I believe that's your client's property. Mr. and Mrs. Brown, correct? Yes, yes sir. And are they adjacent to this parcel? Yes, sir. And who is the property on the east side, which is bounded on, on its west side and its north side by this project? Based on the property appraiser site, it's Wanda, Janice, Smith. And are both of these um, single family lots of a considerable size that are on the Finley Drive neighborhood? Yes, sir. And what is the size of those lots? Uh, we don't have the area on there, but. Right. In considering the um, difference between, let's just look at uh, the lot to the east of your project, how many single family lots abut it, that one lot of your proposed project? I'm not sure I understand. If you count the number of lots north of the lot that okay. is east of your property, correct, and you count them from east to west, how many lots abut that property? 10, 11. 11 single family residences will abut the single family resident lot to the south, is that correct? Roughly, yes sir. How many single family lots will abut the Brown property to their immediate east? I'm not sure exactly where they're well, I don't know where their rear, their north property line is because Kenneth Hudson has it, but several. Are you familiar with the single family lot that is just north of the Brown property, labeled yes. there where the cursor is? Yes, sir. And do you understand that that is a single family home there on a um, approximately four acre site? Yes, sir. Combined with the uh, Miss Brown lot, how many single family residents will be on their eastern boundary line? Looks like 20 and a half. 20 and a half single family resident lots will be to their immediate east. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And the amount of his ex existing buffer there is how much? Width? I think it's 15 foot. 15 feet. What is the buffer to the south of the amenities parcel where the pool, the pool house, the parking lot, and the mail kiosk for all 157 units will be? 
There is no buffer shown on there where they're going to put a fence. There is no buffer to the south of the proposed amenities lot where the pool and the pool house, the parking lot, and the mail kiosk will be. Is that correct? Yes, sir. They didn't ask for one. We probably would have gave it to them, but they didn't ask for that. Staff didn't ask for it. The staff had asked for it, been, you see a hatching right there. Mr. Hammond, um, what other, uh, I guess, ask did staff make of you with regards to trying to get the project incompatible with the comp plan? Well, I don't have the special conditions in front of me, but. We heard about a bridge, correct? Yes, sir. No access to Finley, buffering, bridge. Those are the main things I can think off right off the top of my head. Mr. Hammond, if the um, access to Finley is to be gated and not used, why is it even there? You have to have two entrances on a project that has more than 100 lots. You must have two entrances to a project that has greater than 100 lots, according to the Land Development Code, correct? Yes, sir. So without the access to Finley, this project could not go forward, even to the um, staff level, could it? Based on black and white on the code, yes, sir. Based on the code. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My name is Carrie Car Garrett, and I'm representing the DRC at this hearing. I just have a couple follow-up additional cross-examination questions when you're ready, sir. You're rep representing who? The DRC, sir. Okay. And Mr. Hammond, can you please describe what the um, townhomes to be constructed will look like? I don't go vertical. I don't do building plans, but it's a multi-story, uh, eight unit, maybe some of them are six unit attached single family residences building that will abut the single family residences that are on Finley correct yes sir ma'am sorry and sir would you agree with me that zoning alone does not ensure compatibility Would I agree that zoning alone does not assure compatibility? Well, I mean, I guess there's a comp plan. I know there's a comp plan in the code. So, so you would agree that there's more considerations? Yes, ma'am. Those are all my questions. Thank you, sir. I have a few follow-ups. If I may, um, Mr. Hammond, you were asked about uh, a second access point being required in order to have approval of the subdivision. Do you remember that? Yes. Sir. Does that second access point have to be utilized for normal ingress and egress? It does not. I have another hmm. example there, run. Well, what's its purpose? The purpose of a second, the second. Yes, sir. Is so that if one of them gets blocked, you can get life safety still get in there. Other than life safety, there's no reason that the Finley Drive access will ever be used. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Uh, let me ask you a question. Are you familiar with the buffering provisions of the code, generally speaking? Yes, sir. All right. Are you familiar with 2-2.3 uh, buffers? Well, not without having it in front of me, but I'm familiar. Go ahead. Let me provide you with a copy of 2-2.3 of Land Development Code and ask you to take a look at subparagraph 2. Does that code provide specific instructions for how buffering is to be used to address possible incompatibility between different residential type uses? Yes, sir. What level of density do you have to reach between residential uses before it is required by the code to install a buffer? 10 dwelling units per acre. 
So if you have 10 units per acre adjacent to a less intense use, at that point you have to install a buffer, is that right? Yes, sir. All right. Are you doing 10 units per acre? No, I think we're at eight. You're at eight. So you don't even trigger the provision requiring a buffer, do you? No, sir. Okay. However, you have installed or provided for the installation of the buffer, is that right? Yes, sir. Together with a fence, correct? Yes, sir. All the way around that entire southern edge, you have a fence? Yes, sir. Eight foot fence? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Without this development order, this particular property owner is unable to put in this development of eight units per acre on his property in accordance with the LDC, is he? Apparently. Members of the board, just for the sake of clarity, and I don't know that we necessarily need to, but I want to ensure that I move to admit the package that we've been, he's been testifying from uh, into the record as evidence. Uh, and that'll complete my, after, once that's addressed, that'll complete my question. No objection. And Mr. Chairman, that's the meeting package for today. That was, sorry. That, what he's referring to is the meeting package for t today's meeting, which was, voted into evidence at the beginning. I just want to ensure that it's been admitted into evidence. Yes, sir. It, it, yeah, that's all. Those are my questions, Mr. Chairman. I, I didn't understand. Mr. Chairman, I think he was uh, requesting that the meeting, he would be assured the meeting package is, uh, has been admitted into evidence as a part of the file. And of course, we did that. Initially, yes, <laughs> understood. And that, and that being the case, those are my questions, sir. Thank you. May the witness be excused, sir. Uh, any questions of, of this speaker from from the board? I have a, a question. Um, at any time of your redrafts were you requested by the staff to reduce your lot number? Not in writing. They just told me, they kept saying, hey, we need to do this, we need to do that, and I just kept changing it. Due to the design, stormwater, roads, amenities, so forth, when you redesigned it, it seemed like it kept coming down, the number kept coming down. Correct. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Were you ever asked by the staff not to do single family attached residential? Not in writing. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I have probably one last question, too. We've heard evidence about the surrounding properties. Could you just, and you've seen the pictures that are in the file that are now a part of the evidence, right? I've seen them in person. Okay. Well, could you just generally describe what, how would you describe the surrounding uh, development around the proposed uh, develop, uh, parcel that we're talking about today. Is it, uh, it appears to be fairly, I wouldn't say rural, but certainly uh, uh, there doesn't seem to be a great amount of compressed <coughs> development. Is, is that accurate? You, you've seen it yourself. You've walked the ground, I guess. On the south side is single family residential, probably one acre lot somewhere in that area, maybe a little bit bigger. On the west side, it's also probably two thirds of the west property line is bounded by single family residential, four acre lot that was mentioned earlier. And then the further up is the large lot that's got apartments on it. They're way down to the west, closer to the intersection, but it's still the same parcel. So it's used as multifamily. Yeah. To the north is wetland. North of that is single family residential. To the, to the east is a big wetland complex, and on the other side of that is car, apartment complex. 
to a layman's eye, it would seem to me that this is not a what I would think of as a well-developed area. Is is that a fair? Uh, it's not well-developed. I mean, substandard infrastructure all the way around it. I, I was thinking perhaps more in the kind and amount of buildings that are now present in the area. Is yeah, I would go back and tell you there's a bunch of apartment buildings on the east side and apartments uh, on the west side and single family residential everywhere else. All right. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Board members, any questions of this speaker? If not, thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Chris, uh, I have you on the agenda. Was there something you wanted to say? Okay. I, I don't know. <laughs> All <right>. Surprise. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was for Ms. Garrett. Oh. The DRC representative, if she so chooses. Yes, sir. And I was going to call Mr. Holmer as a witness when the board's ready. I would call Drew Holmer. He is the deputy director of development services, and he's been previously sworn. Mr. Holmer, will you please state your name? Andrew Holmer. And what is your occupation? Um, I work for the Scambia County Development Services de Department. My position is Deputy Director. How long have you been so employed? I've been with the Scambia County since 2006. Can you describe your education? Uh, in this regard, uh, it's bachelor's degree in geography, classes in urban planning, uh, and then work experience on top of that. What is the process for reviewing a preliminary plat? As was described, the, the plan gets submitted to our development review staff. Um, each reviewer from each discipline goes through it, uh, generates a list of comments. Those are sent to the applicant to address. Oftentimes it's, it changes to the plan once those are addressed to the each staff member at that levels and then uh, once they've addressed yeah every all of their comments uh then they get signed off from those different disciplines and after that happens does it go to the drc for review it that is the the drc review at that point um, the recommendation is made for the development or the uh, development order to either be approved or denied. Can you please describe what compatibility is in this context? Sure. So, in this context, um, our land development code is the document that enforces the goals, objectives, and policies of our comprehensive plan. Both of these documents, the the overriding comp plan and its enforcing agent, the LDC, define compatibility. Uh, the comp plan, as Mr. Jones had specified earlier and read from it, defines incompatible and compatible. The LDC describes in the definition compatible. The, the concept is mentioned several different places in the code. Um, one in which was referenced in the letter that was submitted with the uh, with this appeal. What are some considerations for compatibility? Sure. Um, if you can, I pull up the LDC. Yes. Sorry, wrong computer. <coughs> All right. So. What I've, what I've got for you here is the definition section of the LDC. Um, this was probably read in earlier, but it says compatible. A condition in which land uses, activities, or conditions can coexist in relative proximity to each other in a stable fashion over time such that no use, activity, or condition is unduly negatively impacted directly or indirectly by another use, activity, or condition. There's a sec another section 
of the code. Um, dealing with compatibility is in 3-1.6. So this this was mentioned in the um, in the letter filed with the the application for the appeal. And in that letter um, was mentioned that z the top part there, zoning districts provide the primary means to establish and maintain the necessary balance between the needs and interests of different land uses, allowing neighboring uses to coexist successfully in a stable fashion over time, protecting the investments of each. Here's the part that was missed. The second sentence, although zoning separates generally incompatible development, inclusion as a permitted use within a district does not alone ensure compatibility with other district uses. Is, so is one consideration preserving the character of existing neighborhoods? Yes. And sir, what was the reason for the denial? The reason for denial was mentioned in that attachment. Here we have, that was attachment A. Um, if a development order is denied, it says in the code there needs to be a written reason for doing so. And it was this portion right here, attachment A. Um, in short, without reading through the whole thing, this project was denied for being incompatible with the surrounding uses, both in density and intensity of the residential use. Can you describe what density is in this in this context? In this context, density is uh, square number or units per square acreage. Okay, uh, that's quite often the public views zoning as separating incompatible uses alone. When you have districts that allow for residential uses, one of the characteristics is the density, as in number of units per acre. Can you describe what intensity of use is? So intensity of use, there are, there are the same type of use in name um, can produce different effects. Um, you can have one house, an, a neighborhood of 10 houses. Each, each parcel of land has one house on it. You could have a townhome development like this with 157. That's a lot more trips. Um, as far as folks driving, that's a lot more people living on the area. That's more people out walking their dogs. That's more intense of a residential use than a lower number. Was the denial consistent with the comprehensive plan? Correct. And sir, can you pull up an, an aerial shot of, of the neighborhood and the surrounding areas? And an area where we can see kind of the apartment complexes that we've been talking about. Okay, can you describe the apartment complex that is to the east of Outpost? Yes, that is a uh, apartment complex. Um, I believe it's called Governor's Gate. It's, it was a two-phase project. Um, it is to the east. It is across uh, that tributary and the wetlands. Um, as shown on the site plan for the, the project, that's here today, um, 
if you don't mind me dropping back real quick. And I really hope I don't override this computer. Um, just by way of showing you where it is. So Governor's Gate Phase 2, if I'm correct on that name, Phase 2 is this portion back here, which is on the other side of this wetland area. Uh, we have the tributary, we have existing conservation easement, we have proposed private parcels, and the hatching is showing wetlands also. Uh, that whole complex is between this proposed townhouse use and the apartments to the east. Would you agree that there's significant buffering between Governor's Gate Apartments and Finley Drive? That is correct. And can, can we go back to the map? And to the west of Finley Drive, is there another apartment complex off Dernigan? Yes, there is. Um, the parcel where the cursor is, that is a part, that's an apartment complex that's been there quite a while, predates the zoning even. Um, it is bordered on the north by JoJo and on the east. Uh, its frontage is on Jernigan. And can you describe that apartment complex? I don't know how many units are in there. Um, they are, it, it almost looks like duplex type units. Um, um, there's are, are, they sing, are they single story? Yes, they are single story. And to the south of Finley Drive, is there is there something else in that area? Once you go south of the Finley neighborhood um, and you start going east on Johnson, there are several apartment complexes all to the south. It, is that... Is there a significant distance between those areas and Finley Drive? Yes, the the Finley neighborhood, and I'm I'm not saying Platt. Uh, Finley is it's it's a neighborhood. These are all meets and bounds parcels. That's not a sub subdivision Platt uh, that was platted. Um, and to the rest of the apartments that are to the southeast of this, where um, Johnson kind of makes several 90 degrees. Uh, there's apartments down there, but there's also a wetland complex and some lakes. Uh, that's the source of that tributary that runs up the east side of this parcel. And um, Mr. Homer, was the denial consistent with the land development code? Yes. Can something comply with zoning but not be considered compatible? Yes. Has the DRC denied applications in the past? Yes. Those are my questions. Thank you, sir. Board members, any any questions of Drew? I got a, I got a question. I don't know if Drew's the right person. Um, we, we're talking about compatibility. Um, did he have to do a concurrency study for this development? No. I'm sorry? No. no. Skimmy County does not have concurrency at this time. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Smith, I would have just a few cross-examination questions Absolutely. after, of course, Mr. Pugh. Absolutely. Go ahead. If I may. Mr. Homer, I, I heard you say that um, developments like this have been denied in the past for lack of compatibility. Is that right? The question was, have developments been denied in the past? And the answer was yes. Mm -hmm. Have developments of multifamily, I'm sorry, have developments of attached single family next to detached single family been approved in the past? Yes. In fact, if you're building a attached single family development and there is a less intense use adjacent to that, it would necessarily be single family detached, would it not? It would depend on the district that it's in. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let me ask you to pull up document number five, I believe, was the photograph that you showed us, some of the photographs that you showed us. No, I'm sorry, 11. <clears throat> okay, I 
discount it. Let's um, let's go down a little bit. We're looking for JoJo. <coughs> Keep going. That's west on JoJo. Come down to the next one. This is east on JoJo. So this is looking down to the end of the road where the developer proposes to extend the road to get into their development. Is that right? That is correct. There is county right of way down there. Uh, that is the location they're pr proposing the bridge. All right. From this photograph, you cannot see the apartment complex to your immediate right, can you? No, sir. But you're, in fact, standing in front of an apartment complex, are you not? No. I don't know how far down that apartment complex is, but it would be on the south, like you said, is which is the right. Uh, there's some parcels in between there and the corner. Thank you. You would agree with me that use as an apartment is a more intense use than uh, attached single family, generally speaking, would you not? Yes, an apartment is more of a commercial type use. Portions are being rented out <coughs> as a business. Attached single family as townhomes are platted. There was some testimony regarding the fact that zoning is alone does not ensure compatibility. Do you remember that? Yes. All right. the, the idea being that simply because uh, a commercial development and a residential development are both allowed in HDMU, you can't automatically assume they're compatible right next to each other. Is that right? Correct. One of the, the provisions in the code to address those issues is the buffering uh, provision. Is that right? Correct. Are you familiar with 2-2.3 of the Land Development Code? I don't have it memorized. I could pull it up if you need it. Would you? 2-2.3, sure. sir. Sorry, Mr. Holmer, I'm looking for the 2-2 um, landscape areas and quantities. That's in our uh, design standards manual. Sorry about that. I'm sorry, that. I said I'll get yeah. that for you. My, my apologies. All right. There you are. All right. 2 2.3. You see there at the top one, they're buffers. <clears throat> yes, thank you. You would agree with me that the purpose of this provision is to provide a mechanism to minimize or eliminate the impacts of differing uses short of telling a landowner they cannot use their property for what for things that are permitted under their zoning classification. Would you not? Yes. And it actually provides for the use of buffers in a residential scenario, right, under A-2? Yes, it does. All right, let me ask you to highlight the residential section sure. right there. You would agree with me that the a buffer with a fence is required if you're using 10 dwelling units per acre adjoining single family or two family uses, is that right? Exceeding 10 units per acre, yes. That's sir. right. Now, this applicant's not exceeding 10, are they? That's, I don't believe so. I'd have to do the math real quick, but uh, Mr. Yeah. Hammond did testify that I believe he said it was eight. Approximately eight, I believe, is yes, my understanding. Notwithstanding, they have agreed to use a buffer and a fence 
uh, between their development and the single families adjoining in accordance with this provision. Is that right? That is correct. All right. And its purpose is to eliminate these sorts of impacts, is it not? It's to alleviate the impacts. Right. So the, the, the drafters of this code, of this code provision, designed it specifically to avoid the problem that we're having here today. Is that not right? The buffering is to shield a higher, a higher intensity from a lower intensity. Right. There was some discussion earlier about new trips being generated by the um, the intensity of use. Do you recall that? That is correct. All of those trips will be on JoJo. That is correct. The same road that has the existing apartment complex, not on Finley. Is that right? That is correct. Uh, Finley is set aside as an emergency access only. Can I ask you to go back to the map, please, sir, um, which I believe was page 11. Can you zoom out just a little bit? Bring your cursor up to where my client's, the very bottom of my client's property is, please, sir. All right. We've heard testimony about the impact on these houses around Finley Drive of these apartments. Is that right? Yes. Flip over to the other side of that cul-de-sac. Come down. Come straight south. Okay. Right. See that building right there up against the back side of the houses on Finley? What is that? That looks to be one of the uh, multifamily ones that's off Johnson. Right. That was allowed to be built, wasn't it? Yes. I don't have any other questions. Mr. President, may I ask questions of Mr. Homer? Board, any other questions at this time? Yes, sir. Um, I do have a couple of questions for Mr. Homer, if it is okay at this point. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Homer. Would you go on the screen to the um, site plan for Outpost Bayou, and if you will um, highlight that area around the title or zoom in that area around the title. <clears throat> Mr. Homer, there is a description of the land that is uh, part of this preliminary plat. Is that correct? That is correct. And does it include lots 7 through 10 of Block 7 of the National Land Sales Company subdivision deed at book page there referenced? Yes, sir. Are you familiar with that uh, plat of the National Land Sales Company? It's a uh, <clears throat> one of the original platting of large tracts of land in the county is from 1917, I believe. And can you call up a copy of that um, plat? If you'll scroll down, that's uh, um, till you get to the national land sales plat or it may be the other document that you have this one is not it there you go and there in that description does that say that is the plat of the national land sales company from detroit michigan 1917 that is correct and at the bottom do you see that it is at uh deed book 89 274 Bottom left. Yep. And right there, if you will um, kind of highlight in the areas of the description, lot seven, eight, nine, and ten. There you go. Now scroll over. Thank you. So, do you see the? Um, if you'll put your cursor on uh, the first lot, the 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 seven. That'll be the other. I think. Yep, seven, and then eight, 
and nine, yep, and 10. So does that make up the majority of the parcels uh, involved in this um, preliminary plat? That's correct, that's what the, are the central portion. The central portion. What are the two other lots? And isn't the their lot, small lot to the north that you described as mostly wet, is that correct? That is correct. And then what are the two lots that are to the south of this assemblage? The, the two to the south are parcels that are part of that Finley Drive development. And were those two residential lots that were uh, undeveloped? That is correct. And they remain undeveloped today? Correct. But they were part of that Finley Drive neighborhood platting? Again, Not a plat, but a meets and bounds? Yes, sir. And is that what is shown, that area, the kind of the blank area in between the two tributaries that is just south of lots 7, 8, 9, and 10? Correct. That's where Finley is? Yes, sir. Now, if you'll um, scroll down to the property appraiser's website and their underlying area, now we see, can you highlight Finley and the loop right here? Now, where are the two residential lots that are part of Finley that are part of this, this assemblage? Going down, you're right. Give me a second. Here we are. <coughs> Those are the two residential lots on Finley, which are part of this preliminary plat, correct? Correct. And to the uh, west of one of the lot on the west, is that not the brown parcel where their single family residence is? That is the brown parcel where I have the cursor, yes, sir. And then aren't those single-family residences abutting thinly to the south and just across from those right there? Are all those single-family residences? I think so. There may be a vacant one uh, okay. on the east. And then just scroll up just a little bit, maybe just um, ex highlight out a little bit. There you go. Okay, and then move down so we can see lot seven eight nine and ten again clearly and so as they were platted in 1917 lot seven eight nine and ten remain as they were platted correct correct so they have been platted and undeveloped for and since 1917 is that correct I don't believe there's been any development now, just to the west of the um, westernmost lot that is part of the outpost bayou, can you put your that there? That parcel we've heard the uh, talk about as that there are apartments adjacent to this project uh, to its west. But in fact, that parcel is separate from the apartments, is it not? Yes, sir. That's the, the one you can see on the aerial with the lake. And we'll go back to the aerial so that we can see it clearly. But show us where the apartments are that are not adjacent to this project to its west. Where I have the cursor right now, these. The apartments are all the way to the west abutting the access road going north and south, correct? That is correct. Jojo and um, Jernigan is the north-south. And isn't there a large residential uh, lot that is in between that and the vacant lot, which is adjacent to the project? Yes. And there currently lives an individual in a big house there, correct? I would assume so. Okay. All right. And then that parcel to the north, which is a part of that assemblage, is that that's just south of the main uh, branch there, the, essentially the bayou. And you called that wet. How much of that is a wetland and how much of it is being developed? I would have to look at the, the submitted site plan to get you the acreage on that of, of what's wet. And then to the uh, buffering uh, between the apartments, Governor's Gate on the east side of the parcel, you've already explained that there's a significant, that area all the way from the bayou uh, to the east is all in conservation, correct? 
Yes, sir. North to south across the uh, the parcel. And there'll be no uh, construction in that area, correct? Correct. Does that then necessarily force uh, the concentration of density in a smaller area of uplands as opposed to evenly across all 23 acres? Yes, sir. It reduces the developable acreage. Now, if you would go to the uh, aerial, I think it was page three, which gives the aerial with the overlay area of the outpost bayou preliminary plat. And again, we're now looking back at that that we were seeing as, as parcels, and we can see uh, in this picture, we see lots, um, s lot seven is there, and then eight, nine, and 10 are the larger lot. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And then we can see the, um, the branch there to the west and that buffering area, I'm sorry, to the east, and that buffering area to Governor's Gate, correct? Yes. And then to the east, we see the buffer, that is that vacant lot, which is uh, east of the single family residence and the large pond, correct? Correct. And then we see then further west, we see the low lying duplex type apartments, which access from the main road going north and south, correct? Correct. They're at the, the far western end. That's the residence in the lake. And then we see then the two residential lots, which were part of the Finley Drive, which are part of this assemblage, correct? Correct. Are you aware of when those two lots were assembled with the larger portions to the north? Did that come out in your site review? It may have. I was not part of that. Understood. I have no further questions. Thank you, Mr. President. It is now time for public comments. No. Limited, uh, if you will, please, to no more than three minutes. <clears throat> if for any reason uh, you're repeating something that one has done in oh. front no. of you, uh, Mr. Mr. It's Smith, quite all right to just say for or against. Uh -huh. uh, yes, sir. Uh, before we get to that point, the interveners do have a witness they'd like to tender. Who? M Mr. Dunaway has a witness. Oh, okay. Thank you, um, Mr. President, and thank you, uh, Mr. Homer. At this time, we would call Miss Jean Brown as a witness. To explain my appearance. I was <laughs> that high traffic on Family Drive. <laughs> met one car, stepped off the road, car passed, got back on the road, my head went faster than my feet, and this is what you see. Sorry. I don't mean to scare you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Brown. Uh, Mr. Smith, if it's okay and consistent with Mr. Pugh's um, examination of the witness, may I examine the witness from council table? Fine with the board. Thank you. Ms. Brown, please state your full name uh, for the record. I am Dorothy Jean Norris Brown. And Ms. Brown, if you will, that microphone's in front of you, and if you'll address to the board, I know it's a little awkward because I'm behind you, but if you'll uh, <coughs> direct those so that we can get a good uh, hear you and create a record. Ms. Brown, what is your address? 1475 Finley Drive. I have lived there for 54 years and 10 months. Um, it's our beloved home, uh, the best place in the world. And Ms. Brown, if you could look at the um, aerial which is on the screen above, is that your um, house that is directly adjacent to 
the proposed project uh, this, there on Finley Drive? Yes, that's it, where the cursor is. And how large is your lot? Two acres. And how large is the lot that is uh, the next resident over to the east of the proposed project? There's a one acre parcel and then a second one acre parcel that's between my house and Wanda Smith's house, the next uh, neighbor to the east. And how long um, has Ms. Smith or her parents lived on that parcel? Ms. Smith has lived in a parcel across the street where she and her husband first built uh, their home. I believe it was in 1968 or 67. They lived there until her uh, parents died. That home was built sometime later. So on the combined two parcels, uh, Wanda Smith has, and her husband, who is now deceased, have lived there 55 years. Now, Ms. Brown, why didn't you or Mr. Brown buy those two vacant lots that are next to you, in between you and Ms. Smith? We tried to buy that, uh, those two acres in 2004. The owner at that time and still today um, had told us that it was not for sale. Um, there was some activity going on at that time that they were trying to uh, sell that, which of course they didn't tell us, but they just said that it wasn't for sale. We were hoping to uh, get that land for our daughter and her husband to build a home on. Ms. Brown, are there covenants, conditions, and restrictions for the Finley Drive area? That is, it, no. is it a formal, formal neighborhood association? Uh, no, there is no formal neighborhood association. We're a very close-knit group. And what are the general, what generally are the sizes of the um, properties on Finley along the loop? From the calculations that I have done, the average lot size on Finley Drive, um, the entire um, 3101 block, which includes only the Finley Trapezoid, nothing to the north, nothing to the east, uh, no, the east is a separate section, nothing to the west and nothing to the south. We alone are section 13, 1 south 30, 3101. Um, when, that when that survey was done in 1961 and the neighborhood was set up, it was almost all one acre lots. Um, as people have had certain desires, we bought two acres or the house was on two acres. Um, there are others that are uh, three acres up in the right-hand corner, down on the left side lower, going out toward uh, Jernigan. There's a six or seven acre parcel, but basically it was set up mostly as one acre parcels. And as I say, the, I have gone through and done calculations and the average is 1.25 acres. And Ms. Brown, did you um, create a document which listed all of the addresses on Finley, who uh, owns them, their lot size, and the approximate number of years they've lived there? I, that's actually a couple of different documents that I have created. Um, I took the original 1961 survey. There is a clean copy that I think you have with no notations on it. And then there is another one that's about a year old, uh, so it has changed a little bit. There, um, the other one has the street numbers and the uh, people's names. In addition to that, I created a table that showed how long each one, each person has lived at, um, at that address uh, and um, how many are second generation, um, uh, residents and several other uh, columns that I included on that table. All right, thank you, Ms. Uh, Brown. I'm going to, with the board's permission, may I approach with that document? Yes. Thank you.
Ms. Brown, I'm showing you what um, I'd like to be marked as a next exhibit, um, a document. Is this the document that you were just referring to? Yes, it is. Uh, thank you. May I approach? Yes, sir. Thank you. Now, Ms. Brown, uh, with regards to the um, your neighbors in the area, who has lived there l the longest? Excuse me, uh, Mr. Mr. Dunaway. Um, board needs to vote on accepting that. Thank you. Board members, would you like to admit this into evidence? This is title of Finley Drive owner statistics. My, my only concern with this document is that it is done by Ms. Brown, um, who my understanding, I don't know, is not uh, qualified as a land planner. Um, and this is information, although very well done. Um, I'm not sure where she got the information from and it's, it's from someone that's not qualified. So I would caution this information. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe Ms. Dunaway can sort of tell us, uh, while I would agree with what's been said. Uh, I'll be happy to lay the foundation, Mr. Goblin. Uh, I'm not sure what I mean, it's interesting information, but what exactly is it, does it purport to show? Yes, sir, thank you for that question. It purports to show the character of the neighborhood, and I will be happy to uh, ask, continue my questioning of the witness um, before offering it as an exhibit. Ms. Brown, with regards to your neighbors, who has lived there the longest? Um. We have Bill and Jean Brown, Wanda Smith, I believe is 55 years. Um, the lady who lived across the street from me was, I'm sorry, the lady who lived across the street from me had to move out last year and she was actually longer. The three that I remember living on Finley Drive when we moved in was um, Tepfer, uh, Wanda Smith, and then us. We're the oldest ones. And again, Ms. Brown, if you will, lean into that mic so that we can, uh, that mic can pick you up, pick it I'm up. I'm sorry. Now, how did you compile this information uh, regarding addresses, the names of your neighbors, the lot size, and how long they had lived there? Okay, I'll basically start backward here. I had the 1961 survey. There's a parcel number on each parcel for that survey. The far right column uh, I had to use for three different pieces of information. The parcel number came from that survey. The, um, the lot size, going back to the left, the lot size in acres I got from Chris Jones' um, online information. I just went to each individual address and that's where I got the lot size in acres. Uh, the approximate years lived there uh, there is on the Chris Jones site uh, different deeds and other uh, legal documents that show, and by piecing together, uh, some of the documents, of course, were too old to be viewed online, but then I could go to that, and a lot of it, and just, you know, just plain having lived there for 55 years, some of it is just knowledge that I have. Um, but. I tried to piece it together as accurately as I could between the dates on sales, warranty deeds, uh, going forward. So you'll notice um, that I have said the approximate years lived there. Um, so I think that explains that. And then the next one is almost exclusively my memory. 
how many families have lived at each address. Having lived there all these years and known these people, I have a pretty good idea of approximate uh, the number of families. I could be off on, you know, a few, but very few, hardly any. Thank uh, you, Ms. Brown. I would offer the exhibit and the evidence at this time. I'm going to object to admit to admission of the exhibit just on the basis that it's, uh, number one, it includes a tremendous amount of hearsay, and secondly, uh, the witness has acknowledged that she can't certify it as completely accurate. I can't, I can't hear very well. And, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think there's been an objection to the introduction of this document, and it appears that we're at the point where we have to consider whether or not this is really relevant to the question that we're looking at. And uh, uh, if someone, Mr. Chairman, I would think if someone wants them to move the document, then we would see where we are. And if no one wishes, then of course it will not go anywhere. Board members, uh, that, that, that is the question. Do we uh, not accept this into evidence per the objection of the applicant, or do we? I move that we do not accept this document into evidence. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second it. We have a motion. We have a second. Those in favor signify by raising your right hand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Brown, in general, what is the character of the neighborhood, your neighborhood on Finley? It's large lots, single-family homes. Um, we're very spread out. You drive around Finley, it's wide open. There are a lot of trees. Um, but I guess the main thing that relates I guess legally or what you can consider is the large lots, the single family homes, uh, low density, low intensity, um, just a, a, a great place to live, especially if you don't want to be all scrunched in by your next door neighbor. Ms. Brown, how did you become familiar with the proposed development before the board today? The one of our neighbors was strolling her baby around the circle in the baby stroller, saw a man on the uh, development site, and uh, so she asked him what he was doing. He told her that he was taking soil samples, that there was going to be a 218-unit townhome uh, complex uh, built there. So that's how we found out about it. That was December 13th, 2021. And have you reviewed and uh, proposals, the different proposals that Mr. Hammond uh, testified to over the years since that time to today? Uh, yes, there have been five different plats presented, and I didn't bring that up here, but the first one was October, the, October of 21. That was three, uh, three, brother, three Brothers Land. Then it was sold in February to Matrix um, Land Services, I believe is the rest of that LLC name. That was in, uh, you probably have those, that was about March. Then there was another one that was in August, another uh, plat, preliminary plat that was presented in August, another one in s September, and then the final one that, uh, is the December of um, 21 and I have copies of all those and have studied them way too much. <laughs> and Ms. Brown, if um, the DRC had not determined that this project was incompatible with the surrounding neighborhood, how would the proposed development have negatively impact the character of your existing neighborhood? Well, there would be a whole lot more people, and depending on which one of the uh, different plats were, was ultimately used, uh, or at what stage, 
then there would have been a whole lot of traffic. If there were openings on Fenley Drive, then our 18-foot wide pavement would not be able to handle it. The, uh, the pavement itself is one inch thick. I have taken chunks where there are holes in the, in the uh, pavement, paved road, and it's an inch thick. Uh, the noise um, would be increased greatly. Um, Ms. Brown, do you know, um, as the project was presented, that the applicant has indicated that the access to Finley would be closed and used for emergency purposes only. You're aware of that, are you not? Yes. And do you know the width of the pavement on JoJo, which will be the only entrance into this development? Okay, JoJo Road from Jernigan to its terminus at Westside Drive, the right-of-way is 30 feet wide, the pavement is 18 feet wide. There are big oak trees very close on the sides to the point that the roots are buckling up the sides of the pavement. Um, Ms. Brown, why is the requirement for compatibility with the existing nature and character of the neighborhood so important to be met in the comprehensive plan with regards to your existing neighborhood? <laughs> this goes back 55 years. <laughs> that was dirt road. There was nothing. Jernigan Road didn't even go through to Nine Mile Road. It stopped just north of JoJo. Uh, I grew up on a farm. My husband grew up on a farm. Uh, wide open space was really important to us. We uh, found this. It was, it was rural in nature. It was R5 at that time. Um, the, uh, I don't know, it was just a place where you, we could have a garden. We, <laughs> we had a huge garden on the second acre and uh, you know, dogs, later we had kids. Uh, it, it was safe, it was secure. Uh, you know, it was just a nice place to live. Now, Ms. Brown, you knew that someday someone was going to develop the surrounding property. I mean, progress marches on, right? Jernigan Road connects to Nine Mile, additional properties are developed. So why are you supporting the staff's denial of this project because it is incompatible? We believe that the development is compatible, excuse me, that the development is incompatible. Uh, I mean, we want to continue living there. We love our neighbors. It's very convenient. It's a, just a pocket. It's not connected. It, that's a little trapezoid there. Uh, it's, a, it's its own entity, its own, own area, own neighborhood. Um, it's, it's just nice. We can walk <laughs> and I will be back walking. Uh, but I don't, I don't know. It, it seems, um, not right. There are 36 of us homes, homeowners on Fanley Drive. And it, it, it's hard to think that it's right that one owner can come in and change the whole nature of it. Um, uh, so that it's attached. I think in some of them there are like eight attached, maybe some eight attached townhomes. In others groups there are, I believe, six. But that is extremely different from what it is now. Uh, and Ms. Brown, how would a pool, a pool house, a parking lot, and a mail kiosk for 157 units located there on directly on Finley Drive negatively affect the neighborhood, the existing neighborhood? Well, a lot of the ways that I've just uh, stated, the, uh, the traffic and if indeed that entrance on Finley Drive actually comes to be as emergency life uh, factors only, uh, then the traffic would not be that much different. The, uh, the number of people, the noise would, uh, would be there where the uh, pool, mail kiosk, uh, 
those others in the amenity area. There's no fence there to separate it from Finley Drive. The street that is coming down uh, from up on JoJo Road down to Finley, there are 40 units on the west side of that. And, uh, you know, where are those people going to park? How are they going to get to their mail kiosk? If they can't use that, there is no turnaround loop at the end of that street. Uh, those people, I don't see any way that they're, they're going to be using Fenley Drive to park to go to the pool or to uh, have a, a loop through, drive through, uh, pick up their mail and things of that sort. It's uh, sometimes there are unforeseen circumstances. The way it, it looks good maybe on paper, but you get human beings involved. Everybody is going to have their own way of doing things. Where our street will be covered up with parking, I fear. Uh, I could very well have people parking on my property in my driveway. They could be blocking Finley Drive just to use the amenity area. Thank you, Ms. Brown. I have no further questions. Applicant, do you have any questions? I, I do, just a few. Um, before we get started, Mr. Homer, are you able to pull up? <clears throat> I believe what we're looking at here is a screenshot of the property appraiser's map. Would you be able to pull up the map itself so we can look around a little bit? Do you want the property appraiser's map or the county zoning map? Uh, the property appraiser's uh, okay. map, the same one we were looking at, but just a little broader. Right here, yes, sir. Finley. Okay. Yes, sir. Just zoom in a little bit, if you would, so we can see a little bit more. Okay, that's good. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Uh, good morning, ma'am. My name good is morning. Philip Pugh. I've had a few questions for you. Um, so, this, looking at this map right here, the subdivision you've been telling us about, the Finley Drive area, is this, this essentially rectangular drive. Yes. Is that right? Yes. That's the community that you described as being in close and everything. Right. Okay. That's your, that's your neighborhood. Yes, right. exactly. Self-contained. I understand. Um, I, I notice these various properties are, are different sizes. Now, since you've been there, have, have people broken their parcels down for family members and sell you know, to, 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 to smaller pieces? Do you understand what I'm asking? Uh, yes. Uh, there has been one change since this map. If you will look to the left, the one it's actually about a um, close to a three acre and it's got three interior blocks in it farther to the left I'm to the sorry. west right there yeah. that started out as a 2.9 acre parcel plus a one acre parcel uh, and if we show that uh, survey you would see it since that time one person has bought that entire block except for the westernmost approximately half acre, a third of an acre. Uh, the, the cursor would go a little bit down and to the right. That is still owned by a separate individual, but all the rest of that block is owned by one person now. Within the past two or three months, I don't remember the exact date. Yes. <laughs> the, okay, looking at the inside circle, the inner circle, 
the leftmost, that started out as two acres, and it is broken down now into two one-acre parcels. Sure. Then next to the right, that started out as a one-acre parcel, and it is now essentially two half-acre parcels. Um, so over the years, it's become a little bit more intense. Not a lot, but you've had a little <laughs> bit more breakdown. Is that Very little, very but little. yes, some. Yes, ma'am. Now, let me ask you a question. On the backed up to the south side of your subdivision of your neighborhood right there what is that building right there uh, Johnson Lake Apartments how many stories is Johnson Lake Apartments I'm not sure maybe three three or four maybe I, I'm not absolutely uh, certain on that right when that that apartment complex went in it, it went in after those houses that were along with Finley, right? Yes. Yeah, so it, it backs up to, what, five of the homes on Finley Drive? Give or take. Uh, more like two. Oh, I see. Okay, five parcels but two houses. Yes. I got you. Okay. The, the neighborhood, I'm sure, wasn't super pleased to see that go in. Were they? I didn't know anything about it. We did not get notice. That's not something that's in the... Uh, governing documents. Sure, I understand. Down here at the bottom right, there's a, a subdivision that's going in there, Crystal Lake, I think. Do you see that? Yes. You know, was there was there displeasure on the part of the subdivision when that went in? That's basically another world. We are very self-contained. To get there, you know, it takes five minutes to get out on the street and get there. I don't know when that went in. Mm -hmm. I I'm totally unaware and have no knowledge of the history there. So it, it, that's an, on the back side of these lots you would call another world. Yes. <laughs> but on the back side of the lots on the other side, was, you would not call another world. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to understand the difference, ma'am. I'm not trying to be difficult, honestly. Well, I think basically it is. That trapezoid, the, yeah. the almost rectangle, I mean, that is a world. It's yeah. separated. Here's here's really my question. What is the difference in your mind between Johnson Lake four-story apartments backed up to the houses on Finley and these townhomes on the other side backed up to Finley? Well, the, the two people who have the Johnson Lakes behind them are very unhappy with it. I mean, the lights and just sure. all of the unpleasant trees. Um, the outpost bayou, that is a parcel directly beside me, and it impacts me greatly. It's beside your piece. Yes. It's beside your parcel. It's not going to be as tall as Johnson Lakes, is it? Not according to the present uh, plat. The, right, the one that was denied under the development one. Right. Yeah. I believe that's two-story. Right. There were elevations presented. Right. And... Uh, do you know if Johnson Lakes has the same 15-foot buffer and fence between their parcel and uh, that is designed on the plat that was denied beside your property? I do not know. I don't know any of the details about Johnson Lakes. Um, yes, ma'am. I understand. It, it's too close to the fence. I understand. Those are my questions, ma'am. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I have no questions. Go ahead. No question. Board members, any questions of that speaker? Okay. We will move on to public hearing Mr. now. Mr. Chair, we have Mr. Chair, we have one additional witness. Um, at this time, we'd call Alara Mills Gutcher. And board, you have accepted this witness as an expert in the past as well. Yes, my name is Alara Mills Gutcher. And Ms. Gutcher, what? Oh, I'm sorry. You swear to testimony you give today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Is that what you're going? I do. Ms. Gutcher, what's your address? I'm at 2311 Lee Street in Lynn Haven. And how are you employed? I'm self employed. I own my own company. I have for almost 12 years. And what does your company do? Uh, we, are, we are a company of land use planners. We um, help 
developers, we help citizens, we help local governments um, with land use policy and regulation. Briefly describe for us your training, education, and experience. Certainly. I have a master's degree in regional and city planning. I've been in the profession um, close to 30 years now and uh, have worked for both local governments, larger firms, and now myself. Um, during that time, it's been primarily comprehensive planning, um, entitlement work, and uh, policy writing, regulation writing for local governments. And uh, I have done work at the state level, at the local level, and at the regional level. And are you involved with any professional associations? Yes, I am a member of the Florida chapter of the American Planning Association, of which I am the president-elect. I've been involved with that organization for 15 years. Uh, also a uh, corporate sponsor of Northwest Florida League of Cities and uh, Seaside Institute, among other smaller. And have you previously testified as an expert in the state of Florida related to matters of land use, planning, and zoning? Yes, I have. And have you also previously testified and been accepted as an expert here in Escambia County? Yes, I have. And to add, I'm also a certified land use planner and have been since uh, 2001. And I believe um, the board has accepted Ms. Kutcher as a, an expert here today, just to clarify. If not, well, we would tender her. Ms. Chairman, I think we need to actually formally accept her, although she's Correct. well known to our board, and I would certainly move that we accept her testimony as that of an expert in land planning. Do we have a second? I'll second it. We have a second. Those in favor, signify by raising your right hand. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Ms. Gutcher, were you engaged to review this development project? Yes, I was. And what did you do to review the proposal? Yes, I reviewed the county documents, including the comprehensive plan and the land development regulations. I reviewed the property appraiser's website and aerial photography. Uh, I reviewed the documents that the application, the applicant submitted for the review and the request for approval. And did you evaluate the different iterations of the site plan? Yes, mo more emphasis on the, the last one. Okay. And as part of your um, engagement, did you perform a compatibility analysis? Yes, I did. And did you prepare a written report to document your findings? Yes, I did. And is that the report that you have provided to us? Yes, it is. And if I may approach. Mr. Chair, I've presented you with a copy of Ms. Gutcher's um, report and CV, and um, I'm going to be asking her to go through that with us, um, but at this time we'd go ahead and ask to move that into evidence. I'm going to object to the admission of the document on the basis of the obvious late notice, the fact that it was not considered by the board in relation to the denial of this development order. And this is a quasi-judicial hearing on that uh, determination and is the appropriate time for the um, information to be presented. Mr. Chairman, I will say generally we do see these included in the initial uh, evidence that's presented. Uh, I'm not, don't recall getting it uh, I mean, obviously, we're not going to have time to read it. I think it's a pretty safe bet you're going to say that after you read this that the, it's not compatible with the surroundings. Uh, am I right on that point? In short, yes. I was going to go through the reasons and the analysis I conducted to make that determination. 
and, and she can do that through her testimony, but we would like to have the report admitted um, as part of the packet. To, to clarify my objection to the board, you know, again, as you know, we received this motion to intervene a couple of days ago, I think it was. Uh, now I've got in front of me a written report prepared by an expert that I could not possibly be prepared to rebut at this juncture. So I, that, that's, that's the basis for my objection. And as a quasi-judicial hearing, I mean, this is the time that we would present evidence. We, you know, we don't have the opportunity to present evidence outside of this hearing. It's not um, a court proceeding with the same standards, um, but it would be appropriate for the board to consider the report at this time. Well, I just go back to the fact that generally I've always found the and these are always very good and uh, they make interesting reading, but they've generally been included in the packet. And, and the difference here may be that she was retained and is testifying as part of the intervener's case and not um, on behalf of county staff. Um, typically, you may see them when county staff has the report initially but because we only intervened here today and are only now in a position to present any evidence this is the only time and opportunity we have to actually ask that it be admitted and accepted my only other thought is there is a surprise factor in this and i mr pews raised that point i think and uh, you know, you got a basic fairness issue. Uh, normally, I don't have any problems with these. I've always found these helpful and informative, and they've always been, uh, uh, you know, quite useful to me anyway. But I, but I haven't had a chance to read it. And like I said, I've got a pretty good idea of how it's going to come out, but... Uh, well, I mean, to be quite frank, Ms. Gutcher is going to testify as to her analysis and findings, so she, I mean, she's going to tell you what the report says, um, and her testimony is an expert opinion for your consideration. You know, had we presented this at any earlier time, it would have been improper and outside of the confines of the quasi-judicial process. So well, I don't think that's exactly true, ma'am, to be honest with you. Uh, I think it could have been submitted to the staff and the staff would have submitted it to us. Uh, I understand your point, but I, I think I'll, I'll have to respectfully disagree on that point. Tell you what, can you, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm just one person who probably talks more than he should. Uh, I, I agree with you. Um, I'd ask council, um, board council, for an opinion. It, it's at the board's discretion whether to admit the report as evidence. Obviously, the witness is here and can testify to what was concluded in the report, but it's it's at the board's discretion whether to accept it as evidence. Mr. Chairman, I, I don't have any problems with the witness. She's an expert. We've heard from her many times. Uh, and the board knows, is well familiar with her expertise in these kind of matters, and I have no problem with her t giving us her expert opinion, but I just don't think it's fair at this point in time for uh, uh, the report to be accepted in. That's my thought. Did you put that in the form of a motion? Mr. Chairman, I'm going to move that we re, uh, reject the uh, land use compatibility analysis uh, done by uh, the expert. Do we have a second? A second. We have a motion. We have a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of signify, raise your right hand. Rejection is unanimous. Thank you. I'll continue my questioning. Um, Ms. Gutcher, can you explain what compatibility means in the state of Florida? 
Yeah, so of course, Florida statute defines uh, compatibility in 163.3164, and it's essentially the same definition that the county has adopted in their land development regulations with a couple of words that have been inserted at the county level separate from what the Florida statute um, has defined it as. And it's generally um, a condition or a situation where land use is, uh, is introduced to existing land uses and a determination whether or not those new uses can exist in close proximity um, and in general fashion where there is no adverse impact to the existing uses and there's no negative or undue hardship. Um, the county definition also includes a word activities in that definition where the statute specifically talks about uses and conditions that can co coexist with each other. And you've heard testimony here today about um, the difference in density and intensity. Can you just briefly explain what that is? Certainly. So the density is the method to determine the amount of housing or how, amount of dwelling units that can go on a particular piece of property, usually measured by dwelling units per acre. Um, intensity is usually measured by um, the bulk of the structure, the impervious surface of the site, it could be the height, could be um, the area, um, and other factors, usually associated with non-residential development where density is usually associated with residential development. And um, will you just explain to the board your analysis performed um, as part of this compatibility analysis? Yes, and I just wanted to add that the Escambia County Comprehensive Plan also has a definition of compatibility, actually incompatible development, which is a little bit broader than the statutory and the county LDC definition. And it includes structure, size, and design as part of the development, uh, sorry, part of the definition. And as we all know, the comprehensive plan is the ruling document for the city and the land, or, sorry, the county and the land development regulations implement that, that overarching document. So if there's ever an inconsistency between the two, the comprehensive plan rules and we have to follow the comprehensive plan. So because the comprehensive, Comprehensive plan definition includes structure, size, and design. It's something that you all should consider in the compatibility analysis or evaluation of this proposed new use to the existing uses surrounding it. Some of the things that you look at when you are determining compatibility are the density and intensity that we just discussed. Um, lot size can be a compatibility factor, structural height, the use itself, like whether or not it's commercial or industrial, in, you know, residential or some other type of use and how those factor into each other. The bulk regulation, which is which can be tied into the intensity. Um, nuisance potential, whether or not there's um, something going on that's going to be happening on the new site in relation to the existing uses that are currently within the area. And character, of course, is another factor that can be used to measure compatibility. Um, <coughs> So this site that we are looking at today is about 23 acres, I think just a little less, and it is proposed to develop 157 dwelling units on small sized lots adjacent to larger sized lot uh, existing residential uses. Um, there is an analysis that I did conduct that I wish I could point you to in the, in the report, but I did do an analysis of the average lot size of the proposed development through uh, an analysis based on the applicant's submission of the subdivision plat through blocks A through F and exists in relation to what exists on Finley Drive or circle that is to the south. So by block, um, you know, block A has 40 lots, block B has 28 lots, block C has 26 lots, block, block D has 26 lots, Block E has 21 and block F has 16. And these range from the smallest lot is 1,680 square feet. And the largest lot is 2,959 square feet with an average size somewhere in the vicinity based on the, uh, the, block, the block itself around 1,900, 1,950 square feet. That's, that's pretty small compared to what's existing around this development. 
uh, we have an analysis or I conducted an analysis by address of those lots on Finley Drive and the source of my analysis was the Scambia County property appraiser data which does list the um, size of the parcel on the property appraiser site and by address um, of those not including the two parcels that are included in this development I did extract those out of the Finley Drive development I have an average of almost an acre for the size of the lots on Finley Drive. So that's a pretty big difference going from 1,900, 1,950 square feet to an acre sized residential lot. Um, you know, we do have a, a concern there with the compatibility based on the lot size. You know, that's, that's, a, I, that's a very small, skinny lot and we, we talked about that earlier we heard the discussion earlier about how many lots were adjacent to the the existing lots to the south and within one boundary I think we talked about six or seven lots were were at the same distance as the lot to the south um, over here where you see a residential structure on the east side of the two that scoop down in, into Finley Drive. So as an analysis of lot size um, and character of the neighborhood, I found that the proposed development was not consistent. And so it's your um, professional conclusion that the outpost by you plot is not consistent or compatible with the existing surrounding development? That's correct. And. Um, do you agree that the both the comprehensive plan and land development code um, have as priorities or as part of their purpose protection of the character of an existing residential neighborhood? That's correct. Yes, and uh, if I could add, while I'm thinking about it, I was heard, I heard discussion earlier about how the um, development went through the development review, and each department was was looking and, and approved based on the technical aspects of the land development code. Um, True, but the stormwater engineer is not looking at compatibility and the environmental planner is not looking at compatibility. That's the job of the final decision making body, which is the DRC, to look at those, those uh, qualities. And you've heard testimony here today regarding some surrounding apartment complexes. Would you agree that there is natural buffering between the existing residential neighborhood and those existing um, apartment complexes yes and you can see that right here on the aerial photo photography um, the creek that's coming down and the wetlands that are exactly on the east side of the subject property and then um, additionally to the east there is some floodplain or wetlands there area that would separate the proposed development to the apartments down at the end near Jernigan and you've also heard about an apartment to the south um, does existing incompatible uses, does that impact whether or not this use would be compatible just because some other incompatible use may be allowed in the area? Correct. So there, you can't take something that's existing. It could have been approved prior to the adoption of the land development regulation or the develop, land development codes. There might not have been a buffer requirement back then. Um, we'd have to analyze the date that that was approved against the code that was in place at that time to see whether or not that was required. Um, but correct, we can't take existing pre-land pre development code or, or older developments to determine compatibility for a new development that is going to impact an existing adjacent uh, sub, it's not exactly a subdivision but a, we'll call it a, a neighborhood. And is it your professional opinion that the decision of the development review committee to deny this development order was in line with or supported by the comprehensive plan and land development code? Yes, I do. As I had mentioned earlier, the comprehensive plan actually does have a definition of incompatible development, so which includes structure size and design. So yes, I think that's, that's true. And you heard the earlier testimony um, by the applicant. Did, was anything presented, um, did anything presented change your opinion in any way regarding the incompatibility of this project? No. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Board well, members, you. any questions of the speaker? I just have a few follow-up whenever, the, unless the board has any questions first. Sure. May I proceed? Yes. 
<clears throat> Ma'am, let me ask you to, um, specifically in regard to the land develop the um, definition of compatible. I, I believe I heard you say uh, that there would be no impact, um, and I just want to be sure that I understand correctly. The definition of compatibility would suggest that there should be no unduly negative impact on neighbors. Is that a fair representation of what how that works? Yes. Because we live in a community and we all affect our neighbors in some way or other, whether we want to or not. Isn't that right? Well, yes. As as a as a human being, yes. But this is land use, so it's a, a little different when we're talking about land use than just residing or. or sure. So we yeah. want to. We don't want to have un, you know, an undue negative impact. Is that right? That's right. Uh, you, you would agree with me that part of the purpose of the buffering provisions in the code is to minimize uh, impact. Is that right? The key word is part, yes. That's right. Yes. Um, there was some discussion there about those apartments going in, maybe, you know, in, in, in pre-land development code issues. Do you know when the land development code in this county was passed? No, not the first one. No, I don't. No. Did we have a land development code in 2006? I would have to defer to staff. I'd, I'd be happy to let you do so. Uh, yes, sir. In 2006, we had the 2020 comprehensive plan and a land development code, both of which, both documents have been replaced since then. Both of which required compatibility, ma'am. I'm not sure of all the changes that have occurred in the land development code and the comprehensive plan since 2006, so I couldn't answer that was question. Was compatibility an issue in 2006? I don't know if they had that definition in 2006. They have it today. Okay. You don't know if compatibility was a concern in 2006? In 2006? Yes, ma'am. I don't know if they had that definition in their plan or their LDC in 2006, but they do today. Okay. Does staff perhaps know if compatibility was an issue in 2006? I would need to research those documents. Let me ask you to go down there on that. You're, you're, you have the property appraisers page still up, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Let me ask you to touch the information button over there. And now touch on Johnson Lakes. Go to the account. Go down. See in, over here where the deed in 2006 is? Right there. Click on that deed. Ma'am, do you see my prepared by stamp in the top left corner of that deed where I prepared that deed in 2006? I see a stamp in the top corner of that document. I'm prepared by Philip Hugh, that's me. I see Philip Hugh, okay. yes. <clears throat> Were you aware that that's when Johnson Lakes, a Scambia partnership, acquired that property and built that subject, that, that apartment complex? I'm not aware, no. Okay. You're not suggesting to this board that in 2006 that was built before zoning or the land development code or compatibility, are you? To clarify, that's not what I said. Okay. I Thank said you. I wasn't sure, and I, I said I don't know if there was compatibility analysis required back then. Those are my questions. Thank okay. you. I have no questions. Any questions, board members? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. When you, uh, uh, if you have signed up to speak, we're going to call on you now. The time is limited to three minutes per speaker. If for any reason you want to just say, I concur with the former speaker or I concur with Ms. Brown, or I uh, disagree, uh, but uh, you will be given three minutes if, if need be. Please state your name and be sworn in and uh, spell your last name for the clerk. Mr. Chairman, um, as we've been on for a few hours now, I just wanted to know if you guys were interested, if y'all would be inclined to take a break for the audience. On your own time. No, okay. <laughs> Staff has gotcha. called for a 10 minute break. 10? That's 15 a then. 15 minute break. That sounds good, Mr. Drummer. So, okay.
How are they? Yeah. Let's see if uh, let's see if we can reconvene, y'all. Excuse me, everyone. Okay, let's t take a seat, please. Oh, thank you. Attention everyone, attention everyone, attention everyone. These proceedings, they are getting ready to begin again. Thank you. I'll repeat as your, as your name is called, you will be a, a permitted uh, three, three minutes. Uh, it's not necessary to take that. Uh, you, if you want, you can just say I, uh, I'm against or I agree, uh, but whatever you would like to do. And uh, we will start by calling uh, Kathleen Boyle. <clears throat> and spell your last name for the clerk of court. <clears throat> Hello, my name. Yes. Oh. Uh, yeah, I do. B-O-Y-L-E. B-O-Y-L-E. Hello. My name is Kathleen Boyle. I live at 1285 Finley Drive. I've lived there for 40 years. My lot size is one-third of an acre. I am a second-generation Finley Drive resident. I support the decision of the county to deny a permit to Outpost Bayou because the proposed townhome project is incompatible with existing neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Hudson. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Good morning. My name is Lisa Hudson. I live at 1234 Finley Drive. I've lived there for 29 years. I live in a single family detached one story home on five acres. The development property will be located along the entire depth of my property. There will be 18 units alongside my home my home's property line, and an additional six units alongside my driveway leading onto Finley Drive. These 24 two-story units will be 15 feet from my property line <clears throat> and will be overlooking 
<clears throat> my property. The one side of the fence has a single story home, which is my home, and the other side of the fence will have 24 two story homes. This is not compatible with our existing neighborhood. I do support the decision of the county to deny a permit to outpost by you because the proposed townhome project is incompatible with the existing neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Bob Amaker. Robert Amaker. A-M-A-C-K-E-R. Good morning. Uh, I'm a property owner in Wood Run Subdivision, which is downstream uh, on Thompson's Bayou, the little creek everybody keeps talking about. But it has a name. It goes into the University of uh, West Florida at, at its head. Um, I've been there since 2004, so I've seen this creek uh, dwindle and uh, become really a mud hole over time from all the development that's upstream. So this will definitely have an effect, a further effect on uh, Thompson's Bayou and the flooding problem that we have in Wood Run subdivision. Uh, I can say that I've had uh, some professors from the Environmental Science Department at UWF when my son was there, and uh, they came out and looked at this just as an aside to see because they had some interest, and I had some interest in what could be done. And there's all kind of channeling I'm at the end of the the uh, the runoff from coals from uh, the uh, crossings subdivision or not subdivision but apartments that that go through and it ends up being uh, I end up going to the environmental department at uh, at Escambia County to try to see what can be done with the flood wars. Everybody agrees it's a problem. But again, it's, it's a whole different department. So I think this will have an undue effect on the, my property directly. Thank you. Thank you. John Barbin. B-E-R-I, Barberry. My name is John Barberry. I live at 1230 Finley Drive. I own my home and I've lived there for um, almost 29 years. I live there with my wife and eight children. So my lot size is one acres and I support the decision of the county to deny a permit to outpost Bayou because the proposed townhome project is incompatible with the existing neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa Barber. Yes, I do. My name is Melissa Barberi. I live at 1230 Finley Drive with my husband. Um, we've lived there together eight and a half years. Um, before, he, he grew up in that home and that's why his is longer than mine. Um, my lot size is one acre and um, I support the county's decision uh, to permit this um, proposed townhome project because it's incompatible. And I wanted to um, just also bring up the fact that this isn't the first time this particular um, plot has been uh, uh, tried to be developed. It happened in 2007. At the time, my in-laws were part of that. I remember them talking quite a bit about it. And um, originally, the county had approved the plan for 204 um, apartments, but we came before the board to appeal it. And the reason it was appealed was because it was incompatible. So this has come up before, and um, it has been shown to be incompatible uh, to develop it as apartments. Um, and I think as far as that apartment complex to the south, if we had known about it, uh, I think that's a big part of it. I mean, 
I'm the one that was walking my child, my baby, and happened to run into the fella. I had no idea anything was going to be developed. And if you don't know, you can't bring up the fact that something's incompatible because if nobody's going to, you know, go against it, well, then it would be a lot easier just to approve it. So um, when, you, when you know about something, that's when you can say, hey, did you, were you aware that um, this is incompatible? So um, I think that's what would have happened if we had known something else butting up to the neighborhood would be incompatible. So um, anyhow, thank you. Thank you. Betty Salter. Do. Yes. Um, my name is Betty Salter. My address is 1425 Finley Drive. I own my own home, and it's on three acres, and I've lived there for 33 years. Uh, I support the decision of the county to deny the permit for outpost bio because of the proposed townhouse project is incompatible with the existing neighborhood. I'm 90 and my husband is 93 and we enjoy our quiet uh, neighborhood and many of the people that live on Finley Drive are older people too and enjoy the quiet neighborhood. Thank you. Wanda Smith. Good evening. Uh, my name is Wanda Smith. I live at 1435 Finley Drive. I've been there 55 years. I'm one of the original Finley Drive people. Um, my house is on a one acre lot. Across the back of my property, this company has decided to put 11 townhomes across the back of my 235-foot property. On the other side of me uh, is going to be the amenities. That's the pool and the post office and whatever amenities there are. Um, what it's going to do, it's going to impact me all the way. It's horrible to think that just 15 feet from my backyard that there's going to be a two-story house looking down on my property. Um, this is going to put me kind of like in a fishbowl. I object to the building of the townhouses. I support the county, to their denial of permit, and, um, and I thank you for listening to us. Okay. Um, I think that's about it. You've heard everything else um, about the light, the when they tear the trees down, and I have nothing to look at but just air, and other people swimming in there. So just give it a thought. It's not reasonable. It's not compatible. And we just don't want it in the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you for your citizen input. Dawn Citrin. I may have butchered your name, I'm sorry. Citrin. It wasn't bad. It wasn't too bad. <laughs> My name is Dawn Setrin. I live at 1506 River Street. I'm to the north of the property. I own my home and have lived there for 20 years. My lot size is a third of an acre. I support the county's decision to deny a permit to outpost by you. Sorry, I'm nervous. Because the proposal, the proposed townhome project is incompatible with the existing neighborhood. And I know you've, you've heard it already, but I just wanted to reiterate how um, dangerous our roads are there now currently with the traffic that we have now um, 
Pen Air hasn't even opened and filled all their jobs and all the people that will be driving there, more cars. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate that, that the um, traffic on JoJo and West Side is horrendous right now as it is. It's not even compatible now. So just wanted to reiterate that. And then plus the aesthetics of um, our community. I want to keep it that way. That's why I moved there 20 years ago. So I feel it's incompatible with that. And thank you very much. Thank you for your input. Gail Wooten. Good morning. Um, thank you for taking the time to listen to us all. Um, my name's Gail Roten. Uh, my address is 1290 Fenley Drive. I've lived there for 48 years. I intend to die there at that house. I raised my five children there who are all grown now. And I actually, I'm sorry, I'm very nervous. <laughs> Um, I raised my five children there, and I actually lost a child there to cancer a few years back. Um, you know, I feel like everybody else that has spoken today, we're adamant. We're all very close. We're, we're, we're adamant that we want our little neighborhood to stay like it is. It's not that we're opposed to building and, and, and things growing and development it's just not compatible with our neighborhood and I know you've heard this 12 times already this morning it's just not compatible and I would actually invite each of you out there to take a tour of our neighborhood and look at it before you make any decisions after today's meeting or anyone else who has to make a decision take a tour of that neighborhood Again, I thank you for, for listening to each of us today. I hate to beat a dead horse, but I feel the same way. We're just, it's just not compatible. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your input. Betsy Dyers. Absolutely. I hate liars, so we're good to go. I was going to talk to you guys about infrastructure to start off with, but I've decided not to. What I'd like to talk about is using the English language in a bad way. Now, we've heard people talk about the Bennett apartment complex. There's probably not even 20 units there of single-story duplexes. This is not an apartment complex. These buildings are spread over a large piece of land. There are oak trees everywhere. And then there's the guy with the big huge piece of property on the little pond next to them. That's what the Bennett apartments are. Now, the outpost bayou, they mm -hmm. want to call single family attached dwellings when what it really is is an apartment complex. And if anyone is familiar with Outpost, this is a group that caters to college students, young singles. They don't just rent apartments, they rent rooms. They cater to a young crowd who works at home. We have no decent internet out there. So if they do this and those people move in and they expect to work from home, they're gonna get mad. Then they're gonna try and get out of that complex and the traffic is terrible, you can't go anywhere. It's ridiculous. The state of the roads out there right now, it's, it's absurd that they're in the shape that they're in. Sure, nobody wants to cut down the oak trees that line JoJo. If you're going to put more traffic down there than goes there now, you're going to have to. If you want construction traffic up and down that road, you're out of your minds because it's not going to happen. I tried to pass a fire truck turning off of Jernigan onto, see I got onto traffic, sorry. Anyway, 
tried to turn on to JoJo from Jernigan. There's an ambulance there. I can't turn because the oak tree on the corner has roots all about halfway out into the middle of the street. So if you've never seen that road, go out there and look at it in person. Pictures aren't doing it justice. As far as the outpost goes, the developer's going to tell us one thing. They're going to keep that gate on Finley blocked off. He doesn't know what the people who own and run the complex are going to do. They're not the same person as the developer. The developer doesn't care about our community. They don't live here. They don't work here. Our area is not rural, but my children call it the boonies because they live in East Hill. So I agree that this is an incompatible use of this land. If somebody were to come and say put some Bennett apartment style duplexes on that land, we might consider it if they did it right. But there's a wetlands, there's stuff there. It's just, it's a ridiculous way to use this piece of property. That's what I think. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anita Janert. Janer in Louisiana. I, I married that name. You can mess it up. Oh. <laughs> it's, <laughs> G-E-I-N-E-R-T. I do. My name is Anita Gaynard. I live at 1395 Finley Drive. I support the decision of the county to deny the permit to Outpost Bayou because it's incompatible with our neighborhood. I have lived on Finley Drive for about six years, I'm a relative newcomer. Uh, I bought my house on Finley Drive specifically because of the neighborhood. I drove around town, I picked that neighborhood because it had 36 single family detached homes sitting on single lots with a, on a road that had no thoroughfare. Very important. So in our neighborhood, you can walk your dog or your cat, uh, let your kids ride bikes, you can push the baby carriage down the tree line road. And for our older neighbors, and we have neighbors that have poor health, they can safely walk down the middle of the road and they don't get run over. So the neighbors know each other, we talk, we visit, and we help each other. So as for traffic, the county conducted a traffic count study last year for us, and we have 210 daily trips down our road. That's about six trips per household, and that includes everybody, male, man, everybody. So that's the character of my neighborhood. So anything that's not in character with that is not going to be compatible. So how, do we, how does the development compare to my neighborhood? Character and size of dwellings. The development is going to have groups of attached two-story townhomes on lots that are 20 feet wide by 85 foot. That's not very big. Okay, it's either going to be, that's for a three-bedroom or 30 foot by 85 for the four bedrooms. We have single-family detached homes on lots that range from a third of an acre to five an acre to five acres, excuse me. That's not compatible. Traffic, assuming six daily trips per house, that, de that development is gonna generate about 942 more trips down our roads. Finley right now, we have 210 trips a day. That development traffic is four and a half times more than what we have on Finley Drive, not compatible. Parking, the development provides two parking spaces per property one on the driveway, and one in the garage. There's no overflow parking. So overflow parking will most likely end up infringing on the existing adjoining neighborhoods on Finley Drive, JoJo, and Westside. So in our existing neighborhoods, residents have ample parking. I can park 100 cars out there in my yard. I mean, so we don't have to park in our other neighbor's yards. So they're going to infringe on us, not compatible. Trees, greenways, and spaciousness. The development will only have trees and buffers and the conservation easement as required. It's cramped and dense, it's not spacious, and it's not open. Our neighborhood properties are tree-lined. They have a lot of greenery. Our properties are spacious. New development is very dense and it's missing greenery, not compatible. Chapter three of the comprehensive plan says compatible development in a new development. Uh oh, y'all know what chapter three says? Bottom line, development is not compatible according to the comprehensive land development code. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you very much.
10 trailer. I'm, I'm sorry, Pastor, I butchered your name. It's all right. Ted Trailer? T R A Y L O R. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Ted Trailer. I live at 1235 Finley Drive on six acres where uh, the bayou runs right through the middle of our property. And I would encourage you today to affirm. Uh, the wisdom and erudition of Horace Jones by saying no to this particular permit. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Lisa Gorham. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, support the decision of the county to deny a permit to outpost by Excuse me, ma'am. Before you start, let me, let me lower this a little for you. Oh, sure. Thank you. Okay, my name is Lisa Gorham, and I live at 1450 Finley Drive. I've lived there for about four years. I support the decision of the county to deny a permit to outpost Bayou because the proposed townhouse project is incompatible with the existing neighborhood. I live in a single family detached one story home located on half an acre. I will be directly across the street from the end of the main development road and the amenity area. There is no buffer. There is no fence where that development meets Finley Drive. Across the street from my house, I will be looking at two-story connected townhomes. Also, my house is at the end of the main development street, which ends at the intersection of Finley Drive. I will be subjected to hearing car noise, seeing car lights, enduring noise and activity at the amenity area, and being lit up by the amenity area security lights at all hours of the day and night. Given the density of the units and the significant lack of on-site parking, I expect I will also have cars parked on Finley Drive along my property line. Finley Drive is only 18 feet wide in front of my house. If cars park on both sides of the street, I may not be able to safely get out of my driveway. Also, I'm used to working in my yard and sitting in my house in peace. That's one of the reasons we moved there and I enjoy the peace and quiet of our neighborhood. This development will negatively impact my quiet enjoyment of my property. This development is not compatible with our existing neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shirley Peritz. Hello, my name is Shirley Peretz and I live at 1385 Finley Drive. Our lot is slightly over an acre. My husband's family has lived on Finley Drive for over 49 years and we are second generation owners. We did not buy our home for its split level floor plan, nor for its conventional eight foot ceilings. We bought because it was a detached single family home on a large lot in a neighborhood of detached single family homes on large lots. We have built two two-car garages in the last several years. There are many neighbors with motor homes, and many of us have boats. There are trampolines, and we have even had Mardi Gras floats on Finley Drive. There are multiple detached garages and workshops. The proposed development has small 20-foot wide lots with attached dwellings with no room to put motor homes, boats, trampolines, or detached garages. There is plenty of room on Finley for children and grandchildren to run and play, hunt Easter eggs, practice shooting a BB gun or bows and arrows in our spacious backyards. Our lots are large enough we can invite guests over for family events and parties. We have plenty of parking on our own driveways on our own lawns to accommodate our guests without spilling over onto our neighbor's properties. The proposed development has parking for a maximum of two cars per dwelling, one in a garage and one in a driveway. Additional vehicles for the residents 
and all of the vehicles for guests will have to park somewhere else and walk. Will they park on Finley or Jojo or West Side? All large lots on Finley have significant areas of green space. However, the upland portion of the proposed development, which is only about half of the development, other than its amenity area, it appears to be almost exclusively concrete or roofing, impervious materials. It is severely lacking in green space. We fully support the county in its decision to deny the construction permit. The proposed development is not compatible in size of lots. It is not compatible in density. It is not compatible in intensity. And it is not compatible in character. Thank you. Thank you very much. Barry Finch. My name is Barry Finch. I live at 1220 Jojo Road. My home is a single family, one story detached home, and I've lived there for over four years. I support the county's decision, <clears throat> excuse me, to deny the permit um, based on compatibility. We've heard a, a little bit about Jojo Road today, and I'd like to fill in a few details. <clears throat> Jojo Road is a nice residential tree-lined street, and on the north side of Jojo, there are seven single-family residences, a lift station, and a retention pond. On the south side of Jojo are two single-family homes and the Bennett Apartments, a complex that I estimate's about 40 units. Each building is two to four units. The buildings are widely spaced, and um, there's a lot of green space. They are so quiet, we hardly know that they're, that they're even there, even though they're across the street from my home. Around 18 of those units have direct access to Jojo. Per the Escambia County Design Standards Manual, Jojo may be defined as an alley because of the 30-foot right-of-way and the 18-foot or 19-foot um, wide pavement. You've heard about the tree root incursion and the poor roadbed. A traffic study was conducted on March 1st of last year, and it showed that there were more than 1,600 vehicles per day traveled JoJo. This does not include the pending impact of the new Panera office building, which has been built on Westside Drive. JoJo and Westside are used as a cut through between Jernigan Road and East Nine Mile Road, and from Jernigan Road to the neighborhood Walmart and the Panair Bank. With this burden of traffic comes speeding, litter, and noise. We have at times had difficulty entering and exiting our driveway due to the backup of traffic at Jernigan Road. The volume of traffic and litter has increased during the four years that I have lived on JoJo. We often have heavy construction vehicles and an occasional tractor trailer pass by our home. There are no sidewalks and at times it is not safe to walk in the roadway due to the speed and the volume of the traffic. When I rake the leaves out of the gutter in front of my home, I have to put a bucket in the roadway to, so that there is a safe distance between me and the traffic. Outpost Bayou is incompatible with JoJo Road due to the traffic volume and the poor road infrastructure. The additional traffic will impose an additional traffic burden on the residents and this development will have adverse impact on the enjoyment of my property. And again, I support the decision of the county to, the deny, to deny the permit based on compatibility. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Eleanor Pettit. Eleanor, E-L-E-A-N-O-R. Pettit, P-E. Double T I double T. I'm sorry. Absolutely. My name is Eleanor Pettit. I live at 1406 Aries Drive in Pensacola. Uh, 
Aries Drive is the first street that is north of Jojo Lane and west of Westside Drive. My husband and I have lived there for nearly 30 years. There is a strip of property that's previously been purchased east of Westside Drive at Jojo, jo Jojo Lane for the purpose of an exit to the proposed townhome complex. Both of these streets are residential and Jojo Lane is very narrow. It can be described basically as barely wider than a cow path. If a FedEx truck, UPS truck, or U.S. mail is making a delivery, or the weekly garbage truck is picking up garbage, Jojo Lane becomes a one-lane road. Even if a car is parked in front of the house in, in front of Jojo, it becomes a one-lane road. It is very narrow. If there are approximately 200 townhomes, you can expect that at least 400 cars would be there resi residing there. More townhomes, even more cars. You can do the math. This is not conducive and is not good for either neighborhood. Finley Drive ends at Jernigan Road with no stoplight. Jojo Lane ends at Jernigan Road with no stoplight. Westside, Westside Drive ends at Nine Mile Road with no stoplight. If there was a situation when people needed to evacuate, say in the event of a hurricane, and we all know that we do have hurricanes, you can only imagine that both of these areas could turn into parking lots where no cars were moving. This is definitely a safety issue. Currently, we have much more traffic on JoJo and Westside since the opening of the Walmart store at Westside and Nine Mile Road. Penn Air is also making their area their home base. We certainly do not need more traffic on these roads. To have such a townhouse complex in close proximity to R1 single family homes is not a good idea nor is it conducive to either neighborhood. My understanding is that the law says that if you have more than or greater than, if you have at least 100 units, you must have more than one entrance and exit to that property. The entrance exit on Finley, I have just learned today, will only be used in emergency. Therefore, all the traffic will be at JoJo and Westside. This is not acceptable, and it is incompatible with the existing neighborhood and incompatible with the intent of the law. I support the decision of the county to deny a permit to outpost Bayou proposed townhouse project because it is incompatible with both, both existing neighborhoods. Thank you very much. Victoria Griffin. Good morning. Thank y'all for helping, having this. Um, on this map over here, if you look up here on the um, the right, uh, excuse me, the left of the second creek, my home is in Wood Run. And if you were to go, if JoJo were to go back through our backside, it would be JoJo. So. What I wanted to point that out to you is because almost all those trees on the, on the left of that creek would all be gone. So we're going to be subjected to a lot of noise and traffic and lights from this development if, it's, if it is accepted. Um, along that area is about 10 homes on Wood Run subdivision, which are equal to about 2,400 square feet on average. They are single family detached homes on about a third acre lot each. I support the county decision to deny permit to the outpost bayou because the proposed town home project is not compatible with the existing neighborhood. And um, I also wanted to point out that uh, there is no buffing zone there. There would be a, um, a holding pond there. And so there is, I don't consider that a buffing zone, just an inconvenience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kathleen Pope.
And good morning. Thank you for listening to us. Uh, my name is Kathleen Pope. I live at 1510 Zenda Street off of Westside Drive. I own my home, have lived there for 43 years. My husband actually bought the property. My late husband bought the property in 1965. I believe he was the sixth person in the subdivision. I support the decision of the county to deny a permit to Outpost Bayou because the proposed townhome project is incompatible with the, next, with the existing neighborhood. It used to be a very quiet neighborhood. Zenda Street is the almost the northernmost part off of Westside Drive, south of Nine Mile Road, where I used to have a fish pond, two fish ponds, four acres. Uh, in my backyard, I now have a Walmart. At the end of my street, where it used to be open woods, one single house, I now have 14 acres of Pen Air Credit Union. Uh, I was interested in Mr. Finch's total of vehicles, the 1,600 vehicles on JoJo Road, because all of them came up West Side Drive and passed my street, Zenda Street, during that traffic study, to the point I couldn't get out of my street. Uh, yesterday I tried to get out. They were paving a street in the neighborhood, which effectively left me with no way out. It took me half an hour to get from West Side Drive and Nine Mile Road to Davis and University. Half an hour. It's less than a mile. Uh, there are eight streets off of West Side. There's Aries, Aquila, Rivers, Zurich, Dana, Zenda, Zelda, and McGahey. I understandably, most of the focus has been on Finley Drive and Finley Circle, but if you look at West Side Drive, this is where all your access and egress is going to be. You've shut it off to Finley Drive according to these new plans, which means everything is going to go out JoJo and West Side Drive, which makes it impossible for those of us who live there to get in and out. Now, I walk every day. I try to walk at least three and a half, four miles every day. There are two ladies sitting right behind me who do the exact same thing. We know each other. And it's already dangerous enough to walk. I've already, there's a sheriff's report, if you care to look it up, where I was almost hit by a truck, a truck on West Side Drive, and I had to make a jump to the ditch, and I made a sheriff's report on it. I shouldn't have to do that. I mean, I say I have a half acre lot, it's a single family home. Almost every home in the neighborhood is on approximately the same size lot. And it's, it's been very quiet up until now. And I just hate to see the whole neighborhood destroyed for something I certainly wouldn't want to live in. And I defy a lot of you to tell me that you'd like to live there too. So again, I, I appreciate you listening to me and I support the county's decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Karen Jones. Hello, my name is Karen Jones and I live at 9000 Westside Drive, which is three houses down from where they proposed to bring out the entrance. Um, I support the decision of the county to deny a permit to Outpost Bio because the proposed townhome project is incompatible with the existing neighborhood. Ever since Walmart and um, Pen Air Credit Union has opened up at the end of Westside Drive on Nine Mile Road, everybody uses Westside and JoJo as a back way to get out on Jernigan Road. So the traffic has already tripled in um, that 1600 since Pen Air has opened. I think they have probably around 200 employees now. And the only reason that went in is because they were proposing a um, apartments and we denied that and we had no choice um, in the matter because they said they was either gonna put a, a Pen Air there or they was gonna sell it and have apartments. And I've been out there 38 years. I raised my children there. And it's just a quiet little neighborhood that, you know, we, it's just incompatible with what they're proposing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jim Haynes. Okay.
My name is Jim Haynes. I live at, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. My name is Jim Haynes. I live at 1220 Jojo Road. Um, I've owned my home and been there for four years. I support the decision of the county to deny a permit to Outpost Bayou and the proposed townhome project. It is incompatible with the existing neighborhood. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you. Jean Brown, I believe, already spoke. Thank you. I have something else I could say. <laughs> well, we, we appreciate it. <laughs> Duly noted. You all are my government. Escambia County represents me and has, I hesitate to say control, but I can't think of another word. And we rely on the documents, the comprehensive plan, the land development code, the design standards manual. And I'd just like to read some of the important things that I have relied on that, uh, to, and it, to allow you to represent me. The, um, Land, de Land Development Code, Article 1, Section 3-1.1. There are several things here that uh, we rely on. The uh, purpose of the chapter is to promote the economic stability of existing land uses, protect us from intrusions by incompatible land uses, ensure that new development is compatible in character and size, and preserve the quality and character of residential neighborhoods. The comprehensive plan under um, objective housing 1.4, existing neighborhoods, protect the character of existing residential neighborhoods. And there's one other point that I forgot to say earlier. The uh, five, uh, plats that had been presented to the county, every one of those has shown a uh, bridge over the wetlands at the end, at the terminus of JoJo. This is not a surprise that has been sprung upon the developers. The very first one was requiring the uh, bridge over the wetlands. That would involve getting a permit from the DEP I would like to go back a, a further back generation. In 2007, this very same property, there was an attempt to develop uh, a, apartments, something the same density. And that property, that plan also required a bridge over wetlands. That was ultimately approved but was never gone through with for some reason. And there are quite a few of the same players, same principles involved between the ownership of the 04, excuse me, 07 group and the current group. Uh, there have been changes of hands, but it has only been just internal that uh, same people, just different names. And <laughs> thank you very, very much. Thank you. We appreciate your. Thank you. Harry Adams, we see you do not wish to speak. Your vote against the appeal is duly noted. Is there anybody we missed who signed to speak? Seeing none, we will. Move on with the program. Would the uh, intervener like to make a closing comment at this time? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members of the board, um, it is uh, my privilege to, um, 
to represent Ms. Brown. Um, Ms. Brown is perhaps uh, the most prepared client that one could ever have. And in fact, Ms. Brown uh, just gave a very compelling uh, closing argument. But nevertheless, I do want to point out just a few things with regards to the board and again, your responsibilities um, here. This is a quasi-judicial hearing. You have here today heard evidence that was properly uh, presented to you. You have to make a decision whether to support the staff's decision to deny this uh, permit, based, uh, the development based on it being incompatible. You have to base that decision on the evidence in the record. And today you have heard that evidence you are also uh, given guidelines on your compliance review by the Land Development Code, and Mr. Homer uh, previewed that for you when we began. Your review, after having conducted a quasi-judicial hearing, is to consider uh, the appeal. The applicant, that is the proponent uh, for this project, has the burden of presenting competent and substantial evidence to establish that, as uh, the chairman started this meeting with, five different provisions that have to be shown. The first is the decision of the administrative official, that is, in this case, the DRC, was uh, neither required nor supported by the comprehensive plan or the land development code and was therefore arbitrary and capricious. I submit that based on the evidence uh, that has been presented here before you today, you needn't go any further than that particular provision to affirm the staff's decision here that this is an incompatible development and therefore not consistent with the comprehensive plan of the land and of the Escambia County. You have heard evidence from Mr. Homer, who you know to be your expert staff, who testified that this development, this project, is incompatible with the character and surrounding of the existing neighborhood. That testimony was uncontroverted. Um, you have heard the testimony of the applicant's engineer, who testified that through four or five different iterations of this plan in trying to get the project into a position where it might be compatible, the project was not determined to be compatible in the final analysis. You have heard the expert opinion of Ms. Laura Gutcher, who testified uncontroverting uncontrovertedly that the project is incompatible. She gave you the reasons that were parallel to those reasons that staff provided. Those were consistent with the land development code and the comprehensive plan. You then heard from, and by my count, 22 of the surrounding neighbors who testified under oath without objection and without any evidence in um, to the contrary, that the project would be incompatible with the existing neighborhood in which they own, live, and have raised children. You've heard from members of the Finley Drive neighborhood whose single-family residential lots are approximately one acre or more in size, and you have, can see from the evidence in the package that was before you that the only reason this project is before you is because it includes two of those undeveloped, the only two undeveloped lots in the Finley Avenue area. It is with, without those lots, this project would not be possible and would not be here today. The incompatibility is evident on its very face from the drawing that you see in the package that is up on the screen now. If we were not talking about this project having included those two lots on Finley, you might have a different analysis. 
but you don't have that project here. You saw from the evidence the 1917 land plat from the Detroit uh, firm that originally platted this property, and you saw lot 7, 8, 9, and 10, lots which have remained unchanged since they were first platted in 1917. That makes up the bulk of this project. Add to that the two lots that are part of the Finley um, Drive neighborhood, and you have this project. A project which, while the applicant and its engineer have taken strides to try to make compatible with differing uh, um, restrictions, regard, including building a bridge over wetlands, putting in a fence. Nevertheless, in the final analysis, the evidence that is before you is that this project is incompatible. There is no evidence before you to indicate that it is compatible. There is no evidence before you that the decision of staff was arbitrary or capricious. This, I submit to you, is the easiest decision this board will ever make. Affirm the staff's position that this project is not compatible. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any board, any questions of the speaker? If not, would the staff like to give a summary before I call on the applicant? Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. This board has heard from two experts in regard to the compatibility and how this proposed development is incompatible with the surrounding area. The comprehensive plan is the controlling document in this case for consideration as well as the land development codes. The outpost bayou preliminary plat is not compatible as defined in both controlling documents. The comprehensive plan and land development code require that new and redevelopment be consistent with as well as compatible with existing and adjacent land uses. You've heard many times today what the definitions of compatibility are, both in the comprehensive plan as well as in the land development code, as well as found in um, Florida statute, <clears throat> Florida chapter 163. The preliminary plat known as Outpost Bayou is a proposed 157 development of townhomes with multiple levels. This is inconsistent with the low density single family residential area <clears throat> adjoining it. The density allowed by zoning district does not alone ensure compatibility with other district uses. The intensity of the proposed development adjacent to existing low intensity parcels is incompatible. The neighboring area generally has one dwelling structure for each large parcel as opposed to larger structures built across multiple lots in a townhouse development. The proposed development would not complement or enhance the existing area. The board heard from two experts who gave testimony regarding the proposed development and both told you that this was incompatible with the comprehensive plan and the land development code. The applicant has the burden of proving by competent substantial evidence their case and they must outline each element, each condition, there's five conditions and they have to show with competent substantial evidence that they have met all five of those for this board to, to grant the appeal. This decision was not arbitrary and capricious on the part of staff. You have heard testimony from Mr. Holmer, who indicated to you why this was not con why this was inconsistent due to the densities and intensities. And you heard testimony from him that there have been times when the RDC has denied the DRC has denied applications. Again, you heard testimony why this is not compatible with the land development code, based on incompatibility. Those two considerations right there means that the applicant failed to meet their burden. <clears throat> if this board um, is to side with the applicant, they must state with particularity which area the staff aired. 
And I would just reiterate <clears throat> that staff made the correct decision when they um, entered their denial of the application. And that concludes staff's presentation. I don't know if Mr. Board members, any questions of staff? Would the uh, applicant please uh, make your closing <clears throat> remarks, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you. Let me get this microphone. All right. Is that there? We go, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your time, and board members, thank you for your time today. Um, let me start by by saying this. You heard from Mr. Hammond. Uh, and, and, and you all know Mr. Hammond, he's been doing this here in this county for 22 years, 23 years, I believe he said. And what you heard was, this is the first time that he has ever gotten every single department head to sign off on a plat, uh, on a development order, and then had those same department heads turn around as the DRC and say, denied, incompatible. It, it's, that's never happened. And so... When something like that happens, you have to stop for a minute and look at it skeptically. Now, what you heard a minute ago, one of the speakers said that, you know, they rely on the code. Well, sure they do. And so does all the property owners in the county. My, my client, the developer, relies on the code. And what you have here is a situation where what they want to do with their property is very much specifically allowed by the code in every possible respect. The only way that this got denied is that sort of hand-waving of incompatible. Right? There's no provision that they can point to that the, the development order does not comply with. Look, at the end of the day, we realize that the, the property owners in the Finley neighborhood don't want the neighborhood to change, the area to change, not the neighborhood. Right, because what we're talking about is what's around the neighborhood. They don't want the area to change. We all feel those those feelings. We all do. I mean, it's just, just the community and the world that we live in. But the idea that you should look at the 1917 plat and determine that the area can never change, just, I mean, I mean, look at it. We're, we're talking about the nine-mile road area here. And so the question is, you know, where do you, where do you draw the line? Now, what we need to show is uh, that the decision was arbitrary and capricious. Okay, let me give you. A, I just and this is this is just a, a, a Google definition. Okay, of arbitrary uh, and well, let me, let me do one at a time. Capricious, given to sudden, unaccountable changes of mood or behavior. When every department head signs off on the plans, and then they get together and say these are incompatible and throw them out. That is a sudden, unaccountable change of mood or behavior. That is capricious. That's the definition of capricious, okay? Arbitrary, here's the definition of arbitrary. Based on random choice or personal whim, not on a reasoned system, okay? We just saw, looking at this map, that there's an apartment complex down here on the south end four stories high. Look out to your left right there. there there's, it, that's what it looks like. There's a four-story complex right there backed up to the houses on Finley Drive on one side. That's approved. For the DRC to turn around and say that <coughs> two-story townhouses on the other side of Finley Drive are, are incompatible, that is arbitrary. That is, that is the very definition of the word arbitrary. That it cannot come from a reasoned system. It doesn't, it's not possible. And so that's what I'm asking this board to look at. Now, what I heard from, uh, in closing arguments from uh, my, my opponents here, is that you heard from experts who say this is incompatible. It was uncontroverted. That's not true. You heard from Mr. Hammond, who testified that he's been doing this here for 22 years. I, don't, I have no idea how many subdivisions he's taken through this process. He testified that it was absolutely compatible. He brought up a very good point. If you can't put attached single family next to detached single family, what can you put there? I mean, is, is that, does that parcel need to just become a permanent environmental preserve? Does it need to, do, should they put one house on that 22 acres? I mean, that's the question. What can you put next to it? If you have single family residential detached next to an attached single family residential, that's about as close as you can get. There are provisions in the code that specifically define what you do when you have these things come up against one another. Why do we have that buffering provision? 
if we're going to implement it and then say, incompatible. It, it has to have a purpose. In fact, the density that my clients are putting in don't even trigger it, but we've agreed to do it. And you know, my question to the board would be, how could this decision by the DRC possibly not be, be arbitrary or capricious in a scenario where every one of them have already signed off on the plans? They can't point to a single provision of the LDC that, that prohibits anything that they're doing. The buffering provisions that aren't even implemented, I'm sorry, aren't even required or being implemented, it, it doesn't pass muster. Now the other, the other four things I need to show you I think are clear. There's an LDC non-compliance question. The evidence has been very clear. They comply with the LDC in every respect, except for this general sort of amorphous, you know, squishy, incompatible concept, right? Um, that is, has no objective criteria whatsoever, right? Um, that, that's been put in front of you. Um, the other three are really all combined. It's an adverse impact on my client. They have a protected interest and there's a greater impact on them than, any, than, than the rest of the community. Those things are all very obvious. My client cannot proceed with their development that is specifically within what they're allowed to do in this zoning um, classification without the DO. They have an adverse impact. That impact is greater than anybody else. It's their property. They have a protected interest, surely. Every property owner in this county should be able to re re rely on the land development code and assume that they can do what is allowed with their property so long as they don't unduly negatively impact their neighbors. And if, if there's a concern, there are provisions in the code for that. Those are buffering provisions and they've been followed in this case. And so with that, I, I would ask this court to find the DRC's last minute reversal to, to deny this development, review, uh, development order to be arbitrary and capricious and reversal. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, board members, uh, do any of you have any questions of staff, applicant, or intervener? Then the chair will now entertain a motion regarding this item. If in your motion, please state whether or not you adopt staff's findings of fact. If you do not, address specifically those reasons. I move we adopt staff's position. We I'll second it, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion. We have a second. Excuse Any me. Any discussion? I'm sorry. I missed who, who moved. Who moved? Who made the motion? You moved. The, the Marty. I made the motion. Okay. Marty Shack, seconded by Michael Godwin. And, Ms. I would ask you that you you clarify that. Are you are you didn't? Is your motion to deny the appeal, or to? And, and to deny the appeal. Okay. Thank you. Uh, to essentially uphold the administrator's officer's decision. Mr. Chairman, there are two things that come to mind about this. Uh, number one is I appreciate the applicant's uh, discussion of uh, buffering, but buffering is mitigates in many circumstances, but there are some circumstances when you have a development proposed of this size and scale that buffering just is not an adequate, in my opinion anyway, remedy. And uh, secondly, uh, Mr. Hammond's testimony, he is an expert in engineering and as I listened carefully to his testimony, I wasn't, uh, uh, I didn't feel that he uh, really opined or on whether on compatibility. And while on the other hand, we had two experts who did. And I think that that's an important factual matter that we 
uh, could think about. Okay. We have a motion and we have a second. Those in favor signify by raising your right hand. Negative. Negative. Three, three, two. Three, two. Three, two. Motion. The appeal is denied. That concludes our meeting. Mr. Chairman, we will be meeting next Wednesday morning for a regular 21st. Board of Adjustment meeting. Yes, sir. Thank you.